Welcome to the first EU LAC Museums webinar. My name is Jamie Allen Brown and I am the project administrator. It is an honour to welcome you all here today for our first webinar series entitled Community Based Museums in Times of Crisis. We will begin in a few moments. Firstly, I would like to offer some technical information regarding today. Bienvenidos al primer seminario en línea EU LAC Museums. Es Jamie Allen Brown y es administrador del proyecto. Es un honor darles la bienvenida a todos a nuestra primera serie de seminarios en línea titulada Museos de Base Comunitaria en Tiempos de Crisis. Comenzaremos en, algún, en unos momentos. Primero, quisiéramos ofrecer información técnica sobre el día de hoy. Firstly, welcome. Today, we are broadcasting live via our project Facebook page, where we welcome over 10,000 people who have liked our page and are interested in the project research that we have shared. In addition, we are broadcasting via Zoom. Thank you to those of you who have registered to take part. Estamos transmitiendo en vivo a través de nuestra página de Facebook del proyecto, donde damos la bienvenida a más de 10,000 personas que siguen nuestra página y están interesadas en la investigación que el proyecto comparte. Además, estamos transmitiendo a través de Zoom Gracias a todos ustedes que se registraron para participar. If you would like to ask a question or indeed have a comment, please feel free to use the chat box and the Q&A options on your Zoom software. We will try to try our best to pass your questions and comments onto the panel. Si quieren hacer una pregunta o comentario, pueden usar el chat y las opciones de preguntas y respuestas de Zoom. Y haremos todo lo posible para transmitir sus preguntas y comentarios al panel. A webinar recording will be available via our project YouTube channel, Community Museums. The video will offer subtitles in English and Spanish. La grabación del seminario estará disponible a través de nuestro canal del proyecto de YouTube, Museos Comunitarios. El video también estará subtitulado en inglés y en español. Las biografías... The panelists' biographies and webinar links to Facebook and YouTube will be available via our website, www.eulacmuseums.net. Las biografías de los panelistas y los enlaces del seminario a Facebook y nuestro video de YouTube se incluirán en nuestro sitio web, www.eulacmuseums.net. I will now pass you on to the webinar chair and project coordinator, Dr. Karen Brown from the University of St. Andrews. Ahora continuamos con la doctora Karen Brown, coordinadora del proyecto que preside el seminario. Hola. Buenos días a todos. Can you hear me, Jamie? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we're live. Yeah. Okay, gracias. Hola. Mi nombre es Karen Brown, es la coordinadora del proyecto EOLAC Museos y profesora a la Universidad de San Andrés en Escocia. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic and its catastrophic effect on museum and heritage communities, this is the first of three webinars in our series focusing on the topic of community-based museums in times of crisis. Since 2016, EULAC -like Museums has supported community-based museums in partnership with the European and Latin American and Caribbean regional alliances of ICOM. However, in each year of our project's existence, we've weathered a number of difficult circumstances, including the impact of El Nino Costero in Peru in 2017, the hurricanes in Costa Rica and the Caribbean in 2018, the civil unrest in Chile in 2019, and now the most recent unprecedented pandemic in 2020. We took stock of some of these crises during a round table held in the University of the West Indies in November 2018. Today's webinar has attracted over 600 people from six different continents, including the countries of Guatemala, Ireland, Latvia, Guyana, Honduras, India, New Zealand, the Philippines, and the USA. 
Our meeting today is an illustration of how telecommunications, along with the vast networks of global trade, transportation, are making us more inter interconnected than any other time in our history. The way that we as human beings relate to each other, the way we relate to our natural surroundings, seems to be changing exponentially. But when disaster strikes, we have an opportunity to overcome and reconsider our priorities towards a more secure and sustainable future. In the words of Chilean um, principal investigator, Karen Vai, by highlighting their social function, museums can take on a relevant role in the containment, reflection, and memory of crises when they're over. Drawing on a wide expertise in community-based museums and social resilience, the five speakers invited to speak today are eminent members of our project advisory board and steering committee. They have given generously of their time and expertise to our project in its conception, its design, and now its implementation. During the second webinar to be held on the 29th of June, then we will hear from researchers from the project itself, from Latin America and from Europe about their case studies affected by crises. And then in the third and last webinar, we've decided to focus specifically on the role of digital technologies um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's all from me for now. And I very much hope you enjoy today and that you enjoy the series. Thank you. Good day to everybody. My name is Lauren Bonilla uh, Mertav. I am professor at the University of Costa Rica and a member of the steering committee of this wonderful EU LAC Museums project. Um, it's been a, been, it been a great honor to be part of this entire process and we thought it was a great idea to put together this webinar today. Um, I will be presenting each one of the speakers um, and I will be presenting them prior to um, each of their interventions. Uh, so I just wanted to reiterate what Karen mentioned. Um, each one of our speakers is one of our beloved members of the advisory board or um, the steering committee. And as I mentioned before, I will be introducing each of them um, prior to their intervention. Nonetheless, um, we begin today with uh, on a sadder note and wanted to be able to um, take the opportunity to speak in the name of a beloved colleague of ours who shockingly um, and very sadly recently passed away. Um, Luis Repeto, known by his friends and colleagues as Lucho, was a passionate and lively man who passed away just two, two days ago. When it came to culture and her heritage, Lucho was all in. He first studied business administration because he didn't want to be known as a hippie. And then his love of anthropology and ethnography led him to continue his studies in Mexico and down the path toward a career in museums and heritage preservation. He worked tirelessly for years in the National Institute of Culture as the director of the Museum of Popular Arts and Tradition in the Catholic University of Peru. I remember him clearly and one night, two, uh, clearly one night two years ago over dinner in Paris with Latin American icon colleagues where he shared with us, giddy with a childlike excitement, the news that his museum would finally be getting state-of-the-art display cases for, our, for his collection. This museum was his second home, and even after he retired, he couldn't be kept away. Lucho is remembered lovingly within his native Peru as El Señor de los Museos, or the museum's man, having continuously inspired the public to visit museums through his very entertaining television program, Museos Puertas Abiertas, Open Doors Museums. This program, which began in 2010, was very important to Lucho's heart-held belief that culture and museums should be put within the public's reach. As the, as the Peruvian Minister of Culture, Alejandro Neira, highlighted, he sought for culture to reach all Peruvians. His dedication to this endeavor led him to create a new format for the more modern, uh, for a new television program called Museum Without Limits for this year, which was less formal, more modern, and virtual. Unfortunately, it had to be postponed due to the COVID pandemic and now will sadly never be aired with him. Lucho worked arduously for the preservation and conservation of folklore and intangible heritage. 
Many had the pleasure of watching him happily performing as he promoted La Marinera, Peru's national dance, bringing together various generations through this form of shared tradition. He was a great believer in the democratization of museums as public spaces open to all, and always sought to support small or little known museums. He was an integral and pioneering member from Latin America within the ICOM family. It was greatly thanks to his drive that Spanish was adopted as one of the three official languages of the organization, thereby opening the world of ICOM to more colleagues within the region. With great shock and sadness, I received the news of Lucho's passing. It truly feels like Peru, Latin America, and the world has lost a true warrior in the cause of heritage preservation. Fortunately, he will accompany those of us who had the good fortune of knowing him in our memories, and the many recordings of him that remain will continue to inspire us to better mediate within our shared cultural spaces. Thank you and goodbye, dear Lucho. And I quote, we will never be the same as we were before this loss, but are ever so much better for having had something so great to lose. Luis Repeto, conocido por sus amigos y colegas como Lucho, era un hombre apasionado y animado. En lo que respecta a la cultura y el patrimonio, Lucho estaba completamente inmerso. Primero estudió administración de empresas porque, como él dijo, no quería ser tildado como hippie. Pero su amor por la antropología y la etnografía lo llevaron a continuar sus estudios en México y enrumbado en el camino hacia una carrera en museos y preservación del prepatrimonio. Trabajó incansablemente durante años en el Instituto Nacional de Cultura como director del Museo de Artes y Tradiciones Populares de la Universidad Católica del Perú. Lo recuerdo claramente. Una noche hace dos años, durante una cena en París con colegas latinoamericanos del ICOM, compartiendo con un entusiasmo vertiginoso, como de un niño con un juguete nuevo, la noticia de que su museo finalmente obtendría vitrinas de buena calidad para exhibir la colección. Este museo fue su segundo hogar, e incluso después de retirarse no podía mantenerse alejado. Lucho recordaba amorosamente dentro de su Perú natal como el señor de los museos y ha inspirado continuamente al público a visitar los museos por medio de su muy entretenido programa de televisión, Museos Puertas Abiertas. Este programa, que comenzó en el 2010, reflejaba la creencia sincera de Lucho de que la cultura y los museos deberían ponerse al alcance del público. Como destacó el ministro de Cultura peruano, Alejandro Neira, buscaba que la cultura llegara a todos los peruanos. Su dedicación a este esfuerzo lo llevó a crear un nuevo formato para el programa de televisión llamado Museos Sin Límites para este año, que fue menos formal, más moderno y virtualizado. Desafortunadamente, tuvo que posponerse debido a la pandemia del COVID y ahora, lamentablemente, nunca se transmitirá con él. Lucho trabajó arduamente para la preservación y conservación del folclore y el patrimonio inmaterial. Muchos tuvieron el placer de verlo danzar felizmente mientras promocionaba la marinera, el baile nacional de Perú, reuniendo a varias generaciones a través de esta forma de tradición popular compartida. Era un gran creyente en la democratización de los museos como espacios públicos abiertos a todos y siempre buscó apoyar museos pequeños o poco conocidos. Fue un miembro integral y pionero de América Latina dentro de la familia de ICOM, en gran medida gracias a su impulso que el español fue a dos idiomas oficiales de la organización abriendo así el mundo del ICOM a más colegas dentro de la región con gran sorpresa y tristeza recibí la noticia del fallecimiento de Lucho realmente parece que Perú América Latina y el mundo entero han perdido a un verdadero guerrero de la causa de la causa de la preservación del patrimonio afortunadamente nos, en, nos acompañará en nuestro a aquellos de nosotros que tuvimos la suerte de conocerlo y las muchas grabaciones que él, de él que quedan, que quedan disculpen, y las muchas grabaciones de él que quedan continuarán inspirándonos a mediar mejor en nuestros espacios culturales compartidos gracias y adiós querido Lucho y cito nunca seremos los mismos que antes de esta pérdida pero estamos mucho mejor por haber tenido algo tan grande que perder por favor, pido que tengamos un minuto de silencio en memoria y celebración de la vida plena y generosa de Luis Repeto. Please, I ask we have a minute of silence in memory.
Gracias. Thank you very much. Luis was a very, very um, beloved principal investigator of this project and also of ICOM and ICOM LAC in general. He will be greatly missed. Lucho fue un gran eh, y, y, participante de este proyecto de EULAC, uno de los investigadores principales de Perú y será grandemente extrañado. Eh, seguiremos ahora entonces con nuestro primer ponente. We will be continuing now with our, our keynote speaker, Hugh de Varim. Hugh de Varim is a former, thank you very much, Jenny. Hugh de Varim is former director of ICOM from 1965 to 1974, leading the organization during a time of increased internationalization and modernization of museum concepts. It was during this time that ICOM was behind the organization of, of the 1972 Roundtable of Santiago de Chile. Which, subse which subsequently led to the eco-museum mu movement. Within France, he has been an agent of change, leading many projects of local, rural, and urban development, working with natural and cultural heritage, as well as youth programming to promote sustainability. He is a national and international consultant in local and community development and a researcher on heritage practices and policies. Among his valuable publications, all of which he has generously made available on his website are The Culture of Others from 1976, The Community Initiative, 1991, and Roots of the Future, 2002. Hugh is an integral member of the advisory board of the EU LAC Museums Project, and we welcome him to our webinar series today. Thank you, Hugh. We... Do I have to speak? Yes, now, now we can hear you. Thank you so much, you. So you hear me? Yes, we hear you perfectly. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, but uh, I, I feel very important, but unfortunately I'm a little, a little old for adapting to this kind of technology. So uh, I feel, I feel uh, ashamed, I feel... Uh, shy and uh, i don't know i don't know what uh, how i can speak in front of my uh, my computer <laughs> uh, well I, I have prepared something uh, but uh, i think i've skipped most of it uh, to keep with the, the time uh, allowed and uh, just to to tell the to explain five or six points which I had prepared, uh, which I, it came, it's a, a list of, uh, of themes which I collected from the various, various cases, various experiments, various experiences, which I heard about in the last, in the last few weeks uh, while I was, I was uh, locked out in, uh, in my home uh, in France. But I had that on the, uh, on the internet and I can just just mention mention them. Uh, in fact, I think that uh, community museums are much better equipped to cope with uh, the with the crisis like like the the, the pandemics we have now. Uh, much better equipped for because they are. They are not. They are not a building, a collection, and a public of, made of tourists. They are made made by and of the community. They are linked with the community and with the territory, with the landscape, the heritage. So, 
they don't they don't need they don't need entering an, an, an exhibition they don't need they're entering a museum uh, they need they need just to look at their heritage to look at the things they have in their homes they have in their surroundings they have in their landscape and to try to improve develop their knowledge of all these things which are around them so I can take five or six six type of cases. One, of course, the, the the community museum has to serve its community, the population, the people, the families, the citizens, etc. And if I can take uh, the, the first example, which is not from a, a sanitary crisis, which is from a case, a crisis, uh, the, the earthquake which happened in 1976 in Gemona, the Friuli in, in Italy. In Italy, uh, since 1976, the, 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 the memory, uh, there is a risk that the memory of the earthquake fades. But the, the Eco Museum there, the Community Museum there, has decided to create a few years ago a laboratory of earthquakes just to educate the population about the memory of the earthquake, okay, but also about what to do if another, a new earthquake in this region of the world, which is very, uh, which has very often earthquakes, another earthquake would happen. So this is a service to the community to put the community in, in order to react to a crisis like an earthquake. It's an, another, another example, next, uh, next picture, another example is uh, the, this, eco, this Eco Museum uh, of Gemona uh, is, uh, has created a system to promote and to, uh, to commercialize local products which were cut from their normal markets by the by the crisis so this is just another way of because of course the uh, local products are the result of the results of the uh, in, uh, of the unmovable uh, heritage the know-how and the capacities of the people so they they have created this basket of local products, which they com the Eco Museum commercializes directly to the homes of the local local clients, local consumers. Another type of uh, of of, uh, of case which I found w w would be to to tell to help the people, the members of the community, through the the uh, energy of the Eco Museum, of the Community Museum, sorry, to, uh, to look more closely at their own heritage at home. So the museum is, not, is no longer in the museum. The museum is in the, the family's homes. So they can look at objects which are from the history of, the, uh, of their family, the history of their neighbors and so on, and look at concrete objects, describe them, study them, and communicate with the museum by email or by the telephone to give, to add new objects to the, uh, to the collection, to the non-museum non collection of the local heritage. Another thing, another case was in Teresópolis in, in Brazil, uh, they, which the local museum has asked during the uh, confinement, has asked the population to tell, to communicate stories, local stories from the memory of the people to the local, uh, to, to the museum, to the local history museum. Another case, next, uh, and, and another, another type of, uh, is the, a, a, a discovery, a discovery of the landscape. Well, 
the landscape, the surrounding landscape of a, of a museum, of a community, uh, everybody knows it. But not everybody looks at it. So the uh, Eco Museum Parabiago in near Milan, in, in Italy, uh, has created, is every year has had a, a film festival dedicated to the valley of the river Olona, which crosses the, the, re, the small region. And this, uh, this film, this year, because of the, uh, of the crisis, this film has been put on screen. So everybody in the community uh, is able to look at the films about the, the valley and the heritage of the natural and cultural and industrial and economic uh, heritage of the valley uh, at home. So this is a way of uh, keeping people looking at their own environment, at their own uh, uh, community. Again, another type of uh, way of looking at, uh, at the heritage in times of crisis, it is the, uh, the fact that I, I observed, I got information about eco and the community museums, not eco museums, not always, but community museums are uh, native, native museums in, uh, in Brazil, uh, which used the time of the, uh, are using now in the time of the crisis to, to, to uh, express, express their uh, reivindications about their rights, about their, the oppression they have from the government or from the majority of the population around them. And also other cases like in the, uh, uh, in, in, uh, Sepetiba, Rio de Janeiro, next uh, side, um, the, uh, what they call environmental racism, which happens in these uh, disadvantaged communities, disadvantaged populations uh, around the, uh, the big metropolis of Rio, of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, in that case, this is the, the, the community museum is defending, defending the rights of you still hear me yes your audio is now on uh, sorry the uh, so this is, I think, an important role of the community museum to defend the rights of the, the, minor, the local minorities uh, and to use also heritage, local languages, and so on to do that. Another phenomenon which I, I, I observed, uh, and I got, that was recently, I observed recently that even important museums, even touristic museums, uh, in cities, important cities, like the case, the next case, the case is uh, the city of Brescia in, uh, in Italy. Um, this, uh, they, they, they have discovered with the crisis that suddenly they lost their, their public. The public was made of tourists, mostly. So they lost their public and they, they asked themselves what to do with it. So as local museums, because Brescia, the, the castle in Brescia, which is a museum, which is a, an open air museum, but which is a, a considered by a museum and is, is part of the uh, municipal museums of Brescia, uh, this, they decided recently in a meeting that nowadays, they would, since they were missing their tourists, they would have to, t to talk to their population. So that's a phenomenon which I think is interesting to see that more traditional museums or monuments can discover that in fact their primary service is to the local population, to the community. And finally, 
uh, finally the uh, a phenomenon next slide a phenomenon which is the fact of today this meeting today is part of it the fact that this this technology technology which I, I don't like and which I don't know how to use well but this technology the uh, web technology the internet etc this has made possible for local people for local museum for local museum people uh, whether uh, professionals or uh, uh, volunteers or local people uh, in general to teach to others to teach to other museums to exchange because until then i remember when i was with icon the small museum were ne never attended never attended the international meetings. They never met with their colleagues, were there, the, the same the same professionals from other countries or even in the same country from another part of the country. Now these these little people, all of you, people who, who work on the field all the all day, uh, these people they they are no, no longer obliged to pay to pay for for trips abroad. To pay for hotels and so on, they can they can discuss. They can each it's what we you will do now. But I have four or five uh, cases I heard of recently uh, uh, of that. So I think this is one of most most important things which we gained from this crisis, which is the capacity, the, the, the know how the, to know how to talk to each other. And to exchange experience. Here is just a, an, an example of uh, what was made by the French Federation of Eco Museum and uh, Society Museums to uh, show the various categories of activities developed by their members in uh, during the during the crisis. So this is, I think, this is something at least. This is a very positive thing of of this crisis that your museums are able to do new things to create new activities to develop new new concepts thanks to the uh, both to the, the crisis itself and to the technology developed because of the crisis thank you thank you so very much hugh um we really appreciate your words. We thank you so much for um, making the effort of speaking to your computer, but know that you are speaking to people from all around the world. We have participants who are joining us from Iran, from Barbados, from Mexico, from Austria, from Argentina, from Italy, from Kuwait, from Indonesia, from Aruba. So the list continues of all of those people who you've managed to inspire with your work. So thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to remind our listeners that we are also um, welcoming you to submit your, your uh, questions. At the end of the session, we'll be opening up a question and answer period. So we just want to make sure that you're all aware of that. You can send us your questions through the chat. Um, thank you, Hugh. We move on now to our next speaker, Teresa Morales. at Dartmouth College in the United States and then Mexican history at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, the UNAM. Uh, since 1981, she's been a professor and researcher at the National Institute of Anthropology um, and History of Mexico at the INA, the famous INA. Together with her husband, Cuauhtémoc um, Camarena, she has helped establish 24 community museums in the state of Oaxaca. Uh, providing tools for local communities to create sites to strengthen identity and collective memory. Both have also helped create grassroots networks, including the Union of Community Museums of Oaxaca, the National Union of Community Museums and Eco Museums of Mexico, and the Network of Community Museums of America, which brings together community museums from Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, and Bolivia. Teresa is a valued member of our advisory board of the EU LAC Museums Project, and we welcome you today, Teresa. Thank you very much. Well, 
Thank you, uh, Lauren, to the team of you, LAC, for this opportunity. Um, and I am going to try to speak from the perspective of the community museum movement, as, as Lauren just described, the networks that have been uh, constructed, have been built in, in Latin America and Mexico and many countries in, in Latin America. And I'd like to start with some elements of context. Let's see maybe the next slide. And just say very quickly that uh, as our teams have been reflecting on what's been happening during this crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, one thing that has uh, become very clear to us is that the structural contradictions that have been there, have been in place for many years, are being revealed in a more dramatic way. They're becoming more evident. Uh, the conflict of interests and the extreme inequalities between regions, between countries, between communities. Uh, this is something that we can see very in, uh, in a glaring, glaringly evident way as this crisis is progressing. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> so, you know, we can ask these questions that'll help us as, you know, just. Uh, see the situation, who has access to uh, health services that are uh, quality health services? What's been the impact of the privatization of health services throughout the world, which has been going on for a long time? Which countries have a uh, higher quality infrastructure and why is that? Who's controlling or will control the production of a vaccine for this COVID-19 uh, uh, illness? So these are questions that uh, help us uh, see the tremendous uh, imbalance in power and how this is affecting the whole world. Next, please. And this also makes us consider what the underlying causes for this crisis is. Uh, what are the processes of destruction of ecosystems of local territories that are uh, being carried out in these years? And what's behind this a system, a neo-colonial system and world order that is sacrificing human well-being to the accumulation of capital and that is destroying communities that have their own way of life. Next, please. And many of these uh, underlying causes have to do with uh, or we can ask, what, what are they? And it will take us, I think, to uh, look at imbalance in ecosystems throughout the world uh, and the, the tremendous destruction that's, being, uh, 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 that's happening as a result of global warming and other processes and how this is affecting and destroying local communities. Next, please. And in this context, we can also see that there is great resistance, there's strength in the local communities, and there's a capacity to struggle against these destructive forces and to uh, sustain their connection to their territory and to their own way of life and the sources of meaning of their particular experience. And this is also something that's becoming more evident. I think, uh, Maybe we can even see this in protests that have to do uh, the very recent protests of, over uh, police brutality and racism. Uh, there is a great strength in people wanting to affirm what is truly valuable in their lives and what, uh, what is meaningful to them. So this capacity for resistance is also coming, coming forth. Next, please. And uh, the task that we feel uh, inspired to consider is not just about adaptation, about uh, seeing how we're going to, we can return to a normal situation or the new normal, which is very unclear what that means. Rather, uh, we think our task is to uh, analyze and to examine how the situation can be transformed, not to adapt, but to transform the situation to contribute to the transformation of the situation in the, in the big or small ways that we can to contribute to a deeper change. Next, please. 
And in this sense, uh, what is the role of the community museum? And here I'd like to refer to a document that the network of community museums uh, elaborated in their last meeting in Colombia in 2018. And it says that uh, we understand our community museums as key elements to articulate the voice and perspective of our communities as they face current global processes. They are a collective tool for our communities to defend our rights as peoples. Next, please. They are sites of identity, denouncement, reflection, construction, and a place of encounter to strengthen our own structures of community organization. So here we are seeing that uh, communities are taking on this tool of the community museum as a way to uh, become stronger, to have a greater connection with their identity, greater connection with their historical experience, with the sources of meaning of their own uh, local context, their own values, their own way of life. Next, please. And this connection is not just about a nostalgic recollection of something that's nice to remember. It's about survival. It's about realizing how communities have been able to survive centuries of uh, oppression and of exploitation, but still have a capacity to, uh, to remember and to practice their way of life, to uh, be able to live within their territory with their own resources. So again, this is not just a small, the minor consideration. It's a main issue of survival for communities. Next, please. So here we can understand that collective memory is a source of resistance and survival. It's a, an extremely powerful source. It's fundamental to build a pathway to autonomous development that doesn't depend on uh, tourism. It doesn't depend on uh, the decision of someone that uh, will impose a system on the community, but that is built from within, from the decisions, the collective decisions of within a community to decide their own path, their own way to development, their own way of life. That is the, the importance of memory as a resource to do this. Next, please. And in this context, the knowledge of the territory, uh, how this territory provides food, provides well being and sources of healing, provides a meaningful way of life, is essential. And the community museum nourishes this. It nourishes these practices to be able to, to thrive and survive within their own log logic and to dignify these ways of life of each community with its unique experience. Next, please. And uh, in this mission of the community museums, the networks of community museums have a, an important role to play because the networks building up through different regions, different countries and internationally contribute to new ways of constructing power from the grassroots, uh, from the grassroots developing a, a voice that can have an impact, developing a, a possibility to analyze and understand what is happening, exchanging experiences, exchanging resources, uh, strengthening capacities in a collective way, and in this sense, to uh, carry out these activities in a joint purpose to struggle against the injustice of the system of political and economic domination. And next, please. And just as uh, Hugh was mentioning, the tools that are now available in terms of connecting through the internet and connecting virtually are becoming extremely important and uh, I'd like to mention that the network of community museums of America throughout these months that we've been uh, in confinement has been 
meeting virtually and has been developing its own analysis uh, training for the members of the network, uh, planning events, uh, planning uh, things that we can do together. So this is something that's happening right now and that uh, in the future, we think will be uh, continue to be very important because these networks nourish the initiatives of each community to connect in this deeper way with their historical experience, their resources, their knowledge, to value it, to preserve it, to keep it uh, within their practices of government, of management of their territory, of uh, collective efforts of many kinds, of the education and learning. All these uh, extremely important aspects of uh, practices that can strengthen local communities are nourished by the networks that can uh, offer resources in terms of vision and capacities to fulfill these extremely important tasks. And as a, just a last element, I'd like to uh, share with you a short piece of a video that has been made by the Union of Community Museums of Oaxaca about uh, healing. Within these uh, months of confinement, the union has designed or created this short video by the contributions of each community that sent uh, uh, information about the, the plants and the practices of traditional remedies that they have that can be used to be stay healthy in this very difficult time. So just as, as one example of things that can be exchanged and uh, nourished by collective initiatives and has been by the network here at, uh, in Oaxaca, I'd like to show you a small, a small piece of this video. There was a there was a, a background uh, music to this, but I, I believe you can't hear it. But <laughs> so you can see these are different uh, elements, plants, and other elements that uh, the communities are sharing of how they use them. These are things they have in their territory, in their own communities, their own homes, and their own fields, and uh, they are sharing the knowledge of how to use them in order to stay healthy. So that would be uh, one small example of the many, many things that can be done in this, in this context and uh, within the mission that we're describing for the strengthening of local communities. So thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Teresa, for your very interesting um, uh, discussion on what exactly the, the community museums are doing right now. Um, it's fascinating to see how they've come together um, despite difficulties, right, of connectivity and such. Um, we move on now to our next speaker and um, remind you all once again that we will be taking questions um, and comments for our, all of our speakers uh, at the end of today's session. So please do feel free to send those to us. Um, our next picture, speaker is Beatriz Espinosa. Uh, Beatriz Espinosa has professional training in the arts and in ceramics. Uh, she received her master's in theory and history of art from the University of Chile Institution, which she later joined as a professor in the departments of visual arts and theater. Uh, she formed part of the professional team of the University Museums, being in charge of the ceramics collection of the museum's, Museum of Popular Arts. She was also the coordinator of heritage projects in the University's Museum of Contemporary Art. She is member of the Advisory Council of La Moneda Cultural Center in Chile and is part of the National Working Group Against the Illicit Traffic of Cultural Goods. She has been fundamental 
and the establishment and strengthening of the Chilean Committee of ICOM. And she is currently president of ICOM's Regional Alliance for Latin America and the Caribbean ICOM LAC. Beatriz is an esteemed member of the EU LAC Museums Advisory Board, and we welcome Beatriz. Bienvenido, Beatriz. Uh, we just wanted to let you all know that Beatriz will be speaking in Spanish, and um, every so often she will pause and permit um, Ana Gonzalez, who is helping us, kindly helping us with the translation. Um, so every so often she will pause to translate um, into English. Entonces, muchísimas gracias, Beatriz. Eh, le paso la palabra. Hola, buenos días. Buenos días en Chile. Eh, museos y sociedad, algunas respuestas frente a la crisis. Entendida esta como un cambio profundo y de consecuencias importantes en un proceso o situación. Uh, good morning from Chile. Um, this talk is titled Museums and Society, Some Responses in Front of the Crisis, Understood as a Profound Change. El trabajo presenta tres unidades temáticas que recogen las respuestas de la sociedad en Chile, la respuesta de la comunidad museal y también de las instituciones museos. Primero, una primera parte que se centra en Chile, teniendo presente el llamado estallido social y eh, las consecuencias del coronavirus en el país. Las um, opiniones aquí que voy a transmitir son recogidas dentro de un grupo de profesionales de museos y de profesionales del área de la cultura y el patrimonio. Um, I will speak about three main themes, uh, gathering social responses from uh, museum institutions in Chile in response to the social break, outbreak, uh, but also to the coronavirus. And these are responses for, from professional museum and heritage uh, groups in Chile. Perdón. La segunda parte mostrará eh, la situación de los museos frente al coronavirus en América Latina, en algunos países de América Latina, para lo que he recogido la información de varios presidentes de los comités nacional de la Alianza LAC. Uh, the second part will focus on the situation of museums um, now struggling with the coronavirus in different museums in, Lat in Latin America. And this information is gathered from different national committees. Y la tercera parte compartiré algunas reflexiones finales de aquellas nociones principales que desde mi punto de vista convergen en los temas tra tratados. And finally, I will share some uh, reflections, uh, some central ideas that speak to all three themes. Las imágenes que ustedes van a ver corresponden a el, la situación de octubre, del 19 de octubre, eh, en Santiago de Chile, eh, por el llamado estallido social, protesta ciudadana, disturbios civiles, o lo que muchos han dicho, el despertar de Chile. Uh, The images that you're looking at are from the 19th of October in Santiago, from what is called the social outbreak, the civil protests, or what others have called the awakening of Chile. In general, the institutionalidad cultural in Chile eh, cerró las dependencias, las cerró parcialmente. Los trabajadores asistían a los, a los lugares de trabajo eh, cumpliendo jornadas parciales por eh, los grandes problemas de desplazamiento y de movilización que existían. Estaban abiertos, pero no, eh, los museos que estuvieron abiertos no abordaron el tema del conflicto social. En general mantuvieron su, sus exposiciones suspendiendo las actividades educacionales por el, la situación de riesgo para los niños. Existió esta, esta um, crisis, perdón, 
Anna. <laughs> Sorry, yes, that's fine. Uh, cultural institutions uh, were closing, or partly closed. Staff was working part-time at the moment due to different problems with transport. Uh, so museums uh, remained partially open, but they did not deal specifically with the civil protests and they cancelled educational activities because of safety concerns. Como la demanda laboral decreció mucho, se le empezó a producir una inquietud dentro de los trabajadores de los museos porque existían, existen muchas funciones dentro del museo que están eh, tomadas o, o asumidas por profesionales que son eh, terceras, tercerizados, no están contratados de planta en la institución. Y entonces, como se suspendieron muchas actividades, esos programas se suspendieron también. Uh, staff were concerned about uh, different activities from the museums that are carried out by fixed term or precarious workers. And they were very concerned because of all of this activity being cancelled. Si bien los museos de base comunitaria cerraron sus dependencias, sus trabajadores asistían a todos sus lugares de trabajo y desarrollaron actividades relacionadas con la situación y con el contexto social de su territorio. Um, if um, community-based museums were closed to the public, their staff kept working and organizing activities in response to the situation and immediate context. Si bien es cierto, eh, la, la situación eh, que se planteaba en todo el país, en provincias, en las capitales, en las grandes ciudades, era eh, muy inestable socialmente, eh, parte del personal de los museos trabajó de manera muy activa en conferencias, en cabildos, en conversatorios y convocaron, y ellos convocaron actividades en torno a lo que se estaba viviendo de, de esta crisis social. Um, the unstable situation across the country meant that museum personnel was very active organizing conferences, talks, as well as activities responding to the social crisis. Respondieron también a un llamado a recoger testimonio de la situación que se estaba viviendo, de tal manera que acopiaron una serie de, de de testimonios materiales o fotográficos del de proceso que se estaba viviendo. Uh, they also responded to a call to gather testimonies, um, sometimes photographic testimony of what was going on. En relación al coronavirus, los museos están cerrados. Los grandes museos están cerrados y los museos de base comunitaria también están cerrados. La imagen que ustedes están viendo en este minuto corresponde a la, al, al incendio provocado, a los incendios, corrijo, provocados en el, en el Museo Violeta Parra, que está absolutamente destrozado y que eh, vi, eh, sufrió tres eh, incendios eh, de sus dependencias. Um, regarding the coronavirus, museums are currently empty and closed. The image that you're looking at is uh, from the fires provoked at the Museum Violeta Parra, which has been destroyed after it suffered three fires in its building. La verdad es que el museo está ubicado en un, en un lugar eh, muy cercano al foco principal de las protestas, que es la Plaza Italia en el centro de Santiago. Y fue muy, fue muy destrozado. Uh, the museum is located uh, at the focal point of the protests, uh, the, uh, the square in Santiago. Durante el proceso del coronavirus, el, la mayoría del de personal de los museos no tiene... Eh, mayor actividad y no está, eh, está trabajando desde sus casas, eh, solo aquellas personas que eh, tienen que proteger las colecciones para la conservación de su patrimonio y naturalmente que los funcionarios de seguridad. 
Uh, most of the personnel are working from home uh, with only uh, those protecting and preserving collections uh, actually at the museums. Los grandes museos han preparado grandes, o sea, importantes eh, ofertas de, de programas virtuales y ellos están trabajando fuera de fuertemente en poder transmitir a la, a la sociedad eh, el contenido cultural que, que, que cautela. Pero también están dando recomendaciones de protección frente a la, al, al alto contagio que estamos viviendo. Um, they are offering virtual programs and they are trying their best to share cultural content but also recommend safety and uh, health uh, algunos museos institucionales guidelines. Yeah. Perdón, algunos museos institucionales han preparado videos con recomendaciones para la conservación preventiva de las colecciones de los pequeños museos y esas se han hecho llegar a cada uno de estos eh, museos que no tienen profesionales calificados para la prevención Uh, they have also been developing recommendations to preserve collections that are shared across institutions, especially those that don't have uh, professional staff. In general, muchos museos comunitarios de base comunitaria han preparado campañas solidarias de apoyo al personal, eh, sobre todo aquel personal que tiene turnos de presenciales y hacen un, una suerte de acompañamiento a la tarea eh, que tienen que cumplir. Uh, community museums have also been organizing uh, solidarity campaigns uh, to support their staff, uh, especially those that are taking turns at the museum. Una observación interesante ha sido aprendido desde eh, la oferta eh, virtual que se está que están trabajando los museos que tienen tecnología para, para desarrollarla. Es, ellos han aumentado importantemente cierta vinculación con el público y se ha establecido de alguna manera una relación bastante virtuosa. Um, it's also interesting to note that with the virtual offering, Uh, from those museums that have access to this technology, they are getting closer and closer to their audiences. Ahora, esta oferta virtual, de alguna manera, eh, nos señala una cierta exclusión social, porque los pequeños museos, los museos de base comunitaria, no cuentan con, con los equipos necesarios para asumir esa tecnología, ni tampoco cuentan con los profesionales para que asuman ese trabajo. Uh, this virtual offering, however, points to a social uh, exclusion because small museums don't have the technical equipment or the staff to, um, to offer virtual programs. Otra observación importante que aparece en, en las respuestas es que eh, existe mucha inquietud en los museos, eh, en todos los museos, una vez que se vuelva al retorno de la vinculación social, porque la crisis eh, que, que se está viviendo ha demostrado que de alguna forma eh, existe una, una rebaja presupuestaria dentro de las, de las instituciones que financian, y eso ha producido despido y reducción de personal significativo. Uh, museums are also concerned uh, about returning to normal conditions because the crisis demonstrates um, some budget cuts and very low budgets that have um, that have a lot of pressure on institutions and that has also meant losing some of their staff. Las medidas que se han tomado frente al coronavirus para eh, rebajar y evitar el contagio han generado una baja considerable de la participación activa laboral, lo que ha generado un problema económico importante, ya que una parte muy importante de los ingresos del país 
están paralizados. Uh, the measures taken to slow the spread of coronavirus means that there is less people working and it has a very strong impact on the country's economy. Y, y, y podría decir que es, podemos decir que los trabajadores de los museos en general tienen una inquietud y una preocupación por su estabilidad laboral eh, y por el futuro incierto que de alguna manera se anuncia. Um, museum workers are very much concerned about their work stability and the uncertain future that the crisis poses. Muchos consideran que eh, la, 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 los museos debieran de alguna forma replantearse sus su desarrollo, su orientación, la línea de trabajo que tiene. Eh, pero no es fácil, es precisa eh, de recursos, precisa de equipos profesionales y también precisa de una decisión de las autoridades. Um, some think that museums must rethink their mission and their development, but this is not easy. It takes a lot of resources, it takes uh, teams working together, as well as uh, authorities working with museums. Bueno, los museos comunitarios están cerrados y tienen muy poca actividad, han redireccionado algunas de las actividades y están confeccionando mascarillas y delantales para la comunidad que, que, a la que pertenecen y además se han transformado en un foco de información social en su, en su grupo eh, y en su territorio. Um, community museums have also redirected their activities, for example, to produce face masks to their communities and they also work as a focal point for information. Como estos museos comunitarios son independientes, no dependen del Estado ni dependen tampoco de una institución, tienen bastante más libertad. Eh, eso hace que el presupuesto eh, que ellos manejan no dependan de nadie, lo que le da cierta de, de libertad de decisión. Sin embargo, hay varios museos comunitarios, museos de base comunitaria que pertenecen a instituciones eh, regionales, eh, municipalidades, en fin, y esa este, existe en eso, particularmente en eso, cierta incertidumbre de la continuidad del, de la institución. Um, community museums uh, are often independent uh, from any state or other institutions, and in that case they can use their budget as they wish. Uh, although some other community museums do belong to regional institutions, and they face more uncertainty about their future. Una situación que, que, que me parece importante destacar es eh, en los museos de base comunitaria la, el personal vive, algunas personas viven una suerte de crisis emocional porque no pueden asistir a su espacio de trabajo. Esto es de alguna manera genera, le genera un vacío y una inquietud en donde eh, se asimila de alguna manera a lo que le sucede a muchos trabajadores que pierden su trabajo. Um, uh, also, she's noting that within community-based museums, people are suffering sometimes from an emotional crisis because they cannot uh, be at their workplace. So this emotional crisis is similar to those losing their jobs. También es importante destacar que estos museos se han constituido en un espacio emocional que fortalece la vinculación y la conexión social con su comunidad y han creado, junto con algunos museos universitarios o institucionales, un, un programa, unas cápsulas radiales, porque no en todos los lugares donde existen hay plataformas de transmisión, tecnología de transmisión, pero sí existen las radios. Eh, hay un programa muy interesante llamado Las Voces del Museo, que son, como les digo, cápsulas muse museales, que eh, a través de, de radios, de redes de radios universitarias y redes de radios comunitarias, están transmitiendo 
eh, los contenidos del museo, pero también están transmitiendo la, la, la actividad de la comunidad. Um, museums have a very strong emotional bond with their communities. Uh, often they have created some radio capsules. And as an example, she's speaking about a program called Voices from the Museum, which is shared across networks, sharing contents from the museum and from the community. Diría que uno de los grandes problemas que plantea para los trabajadores de los museos eh, el coronavirus, la situación que estamos viviendo, es eh, la crisis laboral. La crisis laboral ha generado una inestabilidad y, eh, y de alguna manera un, anuncia un futuro muy incierto para todos los equipos, de, o mejor dicho, no diré todos, sino más bien para muchos de los equipos de trabajo. Uh, one of the biggest problems um, that we're facing because of the coronavirus for museum workers is um, a work-related crisis that is affecting most of the teams. La segunda parte aborda lo que ha pasado, una mirada a lo de América Latina, eh, principalmente las respuestas de ocho países que respondieron ante una consulta frente a los museos, los trabajadores y a la situación en general de su país dentro del marco del contagio del coronavirus. Los museos en general están cerrados. Los museos de, de, están cerrados con algunos con programas virtuales, aquellos que tienen un sistema de, de tecnológico y, este, y algunos con... Eh, definitivamente cerrados y no sin, sin eh, programación alguna. Uh, now for some responses from eight countries from Latin America La regarding the spread of the coronavirus. Sorry. <laughs> um, a lot of them remain closed, some of them be with virtual programming and others completely closed. La mayoría están trabajando desde sus casas diseñando programas virtuales o dando recomendaciones al, al, a las eh, personas, preparando exposiciones, preparando conferencias, videos, con, eh, en fin. El, se han producido en algunos casos eh, mucha, mucha actividad tele, eh, digital y eh, podríamos decir que solamente... Se repite la situación de Chile que solamente los profesionales o los trabajadores del área de seguridad están asistiendo al, al, a, la, a los edificios. Uh, most uh, people keep working from home, um, developing virtual programming and some recommendations for their communities. There's a lot of digital activity and we see, as in the case of Chile, that only security personnel is attending the, the museum buildings. Frente a la pregunta de la inquietud que puedan sentir algunos trabajadores por la situación que están viviendo, eh, gran parte están, claro, existe gran inquietud y gran intranquilidad por el recorte presupuestario a la cultura en muchos países. Sin embargo, hay, hay dos países, Cuba y Venezuela, que no tienen inquietud, ya que los trabajadores son contratados de planta por el Estado y eso les genera una estabilidad laboral. La, la ley del trabajo en Venezuela y en Cuba protege al trabajador y le da continuidad a su, a su desempeño. Um, regarding the concern of workers because of the budget cuts to culture in different countries, uh, that's not the case, for example, in Cuba and Venezuela, where they have permanent jobs guaranteed by the state who protects uh, these workers. Frente a la consulta cómo están los museos de base comunitaria o los pequeños museos, la respuesta general es que están mal, con muy pocos recursos, muchos de ellos se sustentan por el turismo y el turismo está suspendido, y, eh, pero sí desarrollando algunas tareas frente a, a lo que viene, preparándose de alguna manera para la reapertura cuando todo se normalice. Uh, regarding small museums and community museums, they are doing in general badly with very um, few resources and they often rely on tourism, which is now suspended. 
but they are concentrating now on getting ready and prepared to reopen. Gente, ¿as existe algún factor positivo en, ante esta, esta situación? Eh, la mayoría contesta que ha sido un estímulo y una obligación para despertar la creatividad frente a la comunicación con su público. Eh, en general, los trabajadores han mostrado un alto grado de compromiso reinventando y colaborando con los recursos que cuentan. Y este, cabe destacar también, en algunos casos una amplia participación de las regiones, de las provincias, porque la comunicación les llega eh, desde las capitales, puede llegar a provincias y eso de alguna forma pro ha producido una comunicación muy fortalecida. Um, um, when asked if there is a positive side to the situation, Museums often speak about the need to come up with creative ways to communicate with their audiences. Uh, they feel very much committed to use their resources as much as possible, as well to strengthen uh, regional communication. Frente a la consulta de cuál ha sido la, la respuesta del público, hay variadas. Hay, hay, hay países que han tenido una muy buena respuesta del público y muy dinámica de participación con, lo, con los programas, pero hay otros que tienen eh, una respuesta parcial. No, no, más bien cuentan con un público cautivo que los, que los sigue y que, y que de alguna forma se mantienen eh, vinculados a ellos. Uh, responses regarding their, the audience are very varied, uh, some reporting very high levels of engagement and others not so much just uh, keeping up with their usual uh, public. Como comentario general, ellos apuntan a que no estamos preparados y que no todos manejamos la tecnología. Uh, they also comment that they, they feel not everyone is prepared and not everyone manages the technology. Se ha despertado la alarma y la necesidad de estar al día en el uso de las nuevas tecnologías y de acercarnos de manera creativa eh, con este recurso con este, o con esta herramienta. Um, there is... Um, very urgent need to use these technologies um, creatively. Hay quienes piensan también que eh, como, como algo positivo que esta, esta situación va a enriquecer la suma de profesionales que trabajan en los museos porque necesariamente va a haber que integrar a los profesionales del mundo digital. Uh, another positive side is that this might enrich museum personnel with bringing in people that work on the virtual um, programming. Finalmente, un, algunas palabras de, de reflexión en torno a, a la situación que hemos revisado. Voy a, a referirme eh, a la situación de Chile. Eh, que preocupa socialmente por la violencia que está presente en el país y se muestra frecuentemente mediante la agresión. Ya sea, ustedes vieron las imágenes y, y hay agresión de parte de la ciudadanía que protesta eh, con actos violentos y también de las fuerzas estatales que tratan. Esta, esta violencia se justifica de parte de la, de la ciudadanía y se fundamenta por las demandas ciudadanas. Y las fuerzas estatales apelan y argumentan la responsabilidad del cumplimiento frente a las reglas del orden público. Um, finally, to offer some reflections on the current situation, uh, especially I'm speaking about Chile with the concerning violence in the country that you have seen in some of the images. And it's violence from both the citizens, uh, which is justified because of their demands, but also from the police that are responsible for upholding uh, the law. Además de la violencia eh, física, existe la violencia verbal y de las descalificaciones que aparecen en las redes sociales. Una situación que produce un daño personal absolutamente individualizado. Um, 
there's also, we should speak also about verbal violence that is creating a lot of personal damage. Algunos investigadores sociales y académicos eh, frente a la respuesta de la, de la violencia y también frente a la respuesta del COVID eh, y del alto contagio que, que se ha acrecentado en el país, eh, sostienen de que este es eh, como consecuencia que se vive la anomia en, el, en la sociedad, en parte de la sociedad, entendida esta como la falta de sujeción a las normas o instituciones, o también como el Estado que surge cuando las reglas sociales se degradan y no son respetadas por sus integrantes. Um, some social researchers have also considered uh, the violence in Chile, but also the responses to the pandemic spread. Um, as a state where social rules um, stop being respected at all. Esta novia ha de alguna manera eh, está presente en, en las agresiones de la, que se vieron de, de, eh, durante los estallidos de octubre y, de, y también de noviembre y diciembre del año pasado, pero también ha influido en el, en, eh, con el tema del contagio del COVID porque las personas no respetan las medidas sanitarias establecidas por las autoridades del gobierno desconocen el mandato del gobierno. Um, these aggressions we have seen since October and uh, the end of the year, end of last year, but they also relate to the spread of the coronavirus because people are not respecting the health measures and they don't recognize the government's authority. También se, se, se detecta una, una parte de, de la ciudadanía con depresión, influida por, por la contención, por el aislamiento social y por, por no poder tener eh, la vida normal que, que de alguna forma han llevado. Y, y eso gatilla un, eh, una actitud negativa. Uh, we can speak about certain depression because of the lockdown and people not being able to carry on with their normal lives, which um, comes as a negative attitude. Hay una parte importante de la sociedad chilena que vive miedo e inestabilidad y demanda, por un lado, el control en lo público para retomar la vida urbana y, por otro lado, una parte importante de esta ciudadanía mira con esperanza el futuro con cambios valóricos importantes y con equidad en el desarrollo social. An important part of Chilean society is very much afraid and they are demanding both uh, public control to regain uh, their cities, uh, but also look hopefully towards a more equal future. Finalmente, quiero agregar que eh, me ha parecido importante revisar eh, las respuestas para tener a la vista cuando tomemos nuevas medidas, cuando redefinamos nuestro trabajo. Y porque de alguna forma se me hace muy presente eh, y muy vigente los postulados de la Mesa de Santiago que señala la importancia del aspecto social en los museos, que habla de la integración de las disciplinas y que por último fin, señala que es importante la contextualización contemporánea de, eh, de los museos, que los museos deben tener presente el tiempo que viven y en qué territorio social están instalados. Um, finally, uh, looking at these responses when it's time to rethink our work, um, it's important to recover the round table of Santiago. It's very relevant and speaks of the social role of museums, uh, their interdisciplinarity, as well as their need to respond to the contemporary, the current context. Gracias. Thank you.
Mi querida Beatriz, muchísimas gracias por ese excelente aporte. Hemos recibido eh, muchos, muchos comentarios, así que eh, muchísimas gracias. Um, thank you very much, Beatriz. We, we greatly appreciate uh, your, your intervention. Um, and we will now be moving on to our next speaker. I do want to remind everybody that there is a specific uh, section area on the lower right where you can submit your questions in the Q&A. So you can make comments in our chat, but you can also submit your questions and it would be quite helpful if you submitted your questions in the Q&A section of uh, Zoom. So that's uh, on the lower, toward the lower right of your screen. Um, we move on now to Luis Raposo. Um, our next speaker. And Luis Raposo is head of research department at the National Museum of Archaeology in Lisbon, um, where he served as a director between 1996 and 2012. He has been a member of the advisory committee of the Portuguese National Committee of UNESCO since 2008 and is vice president of the Portuguese Association of Archaeologists. He is currently president of ICOM Europe leading the first project to unite all ICOM regional alliances around the topic of museums and migration. He is also coordinating the project to install ICOM's International Training Center for Africa in Angola. Luis is an esteemed member of our EU LAC Museums Steering Committee, and we welcome you, Luis. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, I think everyone is listening now. Uh, is it so? Uh, everyone, uh, I'm, I'm being uh, listening now. Do, are you listening me now? Yes, we can hear you, Luis. Okay, okay, slightly okay. In. Okay. hearing you. Well, um, first of all, thank you. Uh, I will um, um, move in a different sense from my previous uh, distinguished and very esteemed colleagues and uh, friends. I will not present uh, particular examples, neither in Europe nor in Portugal, where uh, I'm standing. Uh, Please, I, I'm yeah. so, so, so very sorry. I, I hate to interrupt you, but the audio isn't so good. Do you think it's possible for you to turn off your video so we can... Um, possibly hear you more clearly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think that is uh, much me? I hate to not be able to see you, but <laughs> we hear you better. Thank you. It's better now? Okay. So, um, my, my focus will be more conceptual than um, uh, empirical. Uh, I will not present any particular example. Um, uh, I'm, I'm so terribly sorry to interrupt you once again, Luis. Um, unfortunately, the so the audio is is really having really having trouble with the audio. Um, so I think we're going to go with our backup plan uh, because we're receiving many complaints about this. So we're going to move ahead. And I'm so sorry, Luis. We will be receiving questions though for you, um, okay. and we're going to be playing what you've recorded for us. Is this okay? Okay. If you are, uh, it's okay for me. I, uh, no, I don't know if you are listening to me uh, at all or not. Right now we can hear you okay, but it's probably going to get a little garbled again. So I think we're just going to go ahead with what we've prepared. Um, and once we get to the question answer period, we will, we will tune you back in. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will now begin the audio file. Just one moment. Uh, to all of our, our participants, um, give us just another moment to work out what's going on. We have prepared. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you are uh, hearing me now well. Yes. I've changed to another yes. micro. Ah, great. So let's let's give it a try. Let's give it a try if you change. Let's try. So I was... Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I, 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 I rewind. Um, well, I, I see that my slides are began to, to follow, but wait a bit. Wait a bit, please, Jamie. After uh, Samuel Franger, he is the founding director of the Documentation and Rescue Center. Of 
Cultural Heritage, Casa Cojón, ICOM's International Committee of Disaster Resilience, Guatemalan Committee of UNESCO's Memory of the World Program, and is National Coordinator of Blue Shield Guatemala. Samuel appears on the UNESCO list of experts for emergencies and cultural heritage and leads trainings and workshops worldwide in risk management for cultural heritage. Having been certified by ICROM, the Smithsonian Institution, UNESCO, and the Prince Klaus Fund. He is an ICROM instructor and consultant in the preservation of audiovisual documents and archives, and also serves on the steering committee of the Caribbean Heritage Emergency Network. Samuel is an active and dear member of the EU LAC Museum Steering Committee, and we welcome you, Samuel. Thank you very much. Oh, and I also would like to mention that Samuel is going to be speaking in both English and his native Spanish, so our participants can appreciate him in both languages. Thank you very much, Samuel. Um, thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Lauren. Eh, buenos días a todas y todos uh, desde Guatemala. Es un gran gusto compartir y muchas gracias por la invitación. Uh, uh, compartir um, uh, I'd like to say thank you to the organizers of the, this webinar, and uh, I hope uh, we can share some knowledge from uh, Central America here, from Antigua, Guatemala. So, uh, mi presentación la voy a hacer en español y en inglés para que todos comprendamos. Eh, y el tema es museos comunitarios como agentes de rescate de conocimientos ancestrales en esta época del post-COVID-19, que tanto afectaba. Uh, los museos comunitarios en estos momentos se encuentran en una situación eh, de retos, de oportunidades, eh, dramas también, como hemos escuchado con los colegas eh, que estuvieron antes en las presentaciones anteriores, y yo, pero a la vez siendo positivo, yo, yo, pensamos que esta es una valiosa y única oportunidad para los museos eh, comunitarios, para llenar esos espacios vacíos que sus actualidades, eh, que sus eh, comunidades eh, actualmente están experimentando debido a esta pandemia. So at this time, I think community museums have a big challenge and uh, and a big uh, and yet a big opportunity uh, um, towards this uh, situation that has been, uh, risen uh, in the last three months. Uh, Community museums have the opportunity to fill those empty spaces that are, are we are experiencing uh, experiencing due to the pandemics. So, um, let's try to see that if I can move this to the next slide. Okay. Uh, como sabemos, el, la pandemia. Uh, de la noche a la mañana ha impactado a la entera humanidad por su rápido y mortal desplazamiento, causando dolor, miseria y pánico en tantas familias. También está teniendo un impacto muy grande en el patrimonio intangible. Aquí vemos una diapositiva de patrimonio tangible por el momento, pero afortunadamente nuestro patrimonio tangible en Latinoamérica no ha sido afectado por este agente o por este peligro de la pandemia, pero más que todo ha sido el impacto en el patrimonio cultural intangible de las comunidades, obligando a dejar de practicar celebraciones muy importantes como lo fue la pasada Semana Santa, las fiestas patronales, rituales del ciclo de agricultura, y en su lugar estamos realizando prácticas muy distintas a las que estamos acostumbrados como por ejemplo los funerales de nuestros difuntos sin la presencia de la familia y las exequias eh, tradicionales. Hoy estamos enterrando a nuestra familia, a nuestros amigos, con un límite de 10 personas eh, si tenemos una. So, there is no doubt that this pandemic has affected overnight the entire humanity, uh, causing a lot of pain, misery and panic in, within many families. This is also having a great impact in our intangible cultural heritage. Fortunately, our uh, tangible heritage has not been affected by this agent, but uh, the intangible cultural heritage of the communities has forced, uh, has been affected uh, since uh, uh, this pandemic has uh, forced us to practice uh, traditions or customs that are not the, the traditional ones. Like for example, the, the Christian saint uh, festivals, the Holy Week in, 
in the area, which was two months ago when the pandemic arrived, the, the agricultural cycles, and, and also uh, especially funerals today, uh, we are very limited to, to bury our, our relatives or our friends. And uh, in, um, without the, 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 the usual um, uh, traditions or without the usual um, rituals that we accustom in uh, doing these uh, occasions. So intangible cultural heritage um, might be affected temporarily uh, as time goes by. But however, these changes have a lot of influence in our habits, in our behavior, in our practices, as resilient human beings that we are. Indudable, eh, aunque sean cambios temporales los que eh, esta pandemia está causando en el patrimonio inmaterial o intangible, conforme transcurre el tiempo, estos cambios influyen y transforman nuestros comportamientos, nuestros hábitos y prácticas. Como humanos que somos con capacidad para ser resilientes a las circunstancias que se nos presenten, poco a poco nos vamos adaptando a esta situación. Eh, este es un gran momento de la historia, eh, que en este momento los museos comunitarios tienen una gran responsabilidad en el proceso de recuperación de la identidad cultural de sus comunidades, su reconstrucción social, económica, política, a través de una interrelación de solidaridad, hermandad y re reciprocidad. Es ahora cuando la madre tierra nos pide vivir en comunidad y olvidarnos del individualismo comentan los ancian, ancianos y sabios indígenas de diferentes grupos étnicos del planeta. El mundo moderno ha dejado de, de practicar el concepto de comunidad. This is a moment in history where community museums have a big responsibility in the process of recovering our uh, cultural identity uh, uh, and the cultural identity of our communities. The rebuilding of uh, the social, economy, economical, and political um, um, issues uh, throughout the interrelation with solidarity, brotherhood, rep rep uh, rep rep uh, so it is now that the Mother Earth has asked us to live in community and forget about individual issues. That's what the the elders think that the elders, the, 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 the wise people of our communities are saying, you know, it is time now to practice the concept of community, which has been lost in modern times. Además de la función de, de transmitir conocimientos a su comunidad, es muy importante que esta privilegiada relación y confianza que existe entre los museos y las comunidades sea ahora bien aprovechada para rescatar y difundir los conocimientos ancestrales de la comunidad, crear actividades y programas de sostenibilidad para beneficio de estos portadores de esos conocimientos y que estos sean transmitidos a las nuevas generaciones para que florezcan y se reproduzcan a través del tiempo. So, beyond the function of a community museum of just uh, communicating uh, knowledge to the community, it is now the time also to retrieve that, that knowledge, the community knowledge, as it, as it has been mentioned by previous presenters today. Uh, I think this is a very um, uh, privileged time for community museums to make use of this uh, trust, of this confidence, this relation that, that exists between communities and museums. Uh, it is very important that we use that that status of uh, trust to also retrieve information from the community to try to rescue the ancestral uh, knowledge. La pandemia del COVID-19 revela que hay una gran necesidad de retomar prácticas ancestrales. Por ejemplo, aquí vemos a sacerdotes mayas, eh, eh, mujeres eh, guías espirituales que tienen un gran conocimiento. Eh, la pandemia COVID revela que hay una gran necesidad de retornar a prácticas ancestrales en el tema de salud, tomando en cuenta que pandemias y enfermedades han existido en el mundo a través de la historia, sin medicinas y sin tecnología se ha sobrevivido. 
Los conocimientos ancestrales perduran y son muy valiosos en estos momentos, en el que tendremos la oportunidad de combinarlos con los avanzados conocimientos científicos occidentales. So, the pandemic has revealed also uh, that there is a need, there is a very strong need to go back to, to the, the ancestral knowledge of our elders, the old medicine men, you know, people who, uh, who has this knowledge um, about traditional medicine. You know, there, are, there have been pandemics and disasters all, uh, throughout history, throughout human history. And there, was no, there were no chemical medicines, there was no um, uh, technology, uh, and they have survived. So uh, I think now we have this big opportunity to uh, use, um, to combine both ancestral knowledge with the scientific Western uh, knowledge of today. So according to the... Yes, y retomar el video, porque yo estoy desconectada. According to... Um, yeah. Uh, to the to the elder people, um, there is no 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 illness. There is no unbalance. We have created everything. Uh, at the same time, we have damaged our mother earth. Uh, natural disasters do not exist. They are created by the same human being. Según los ancianos, no existe la enfermedad. Es un desequilibrio que hemos fomentado nosotros mismos al igual que lo hemos hecho con la salud de la madre tierra. Los desastres naturales no existen, los creamos nosotros mismos. Los um, so, eh, ahora voy a pasar a un tema, eh, un caso que estamos viviendo aquí en Guatemala, en la antigua Guatemala, que es un lugar muy conocido por uh, sus tradiciones, por su, es un patrimonio de la UNESCO como sitio de la paz de la humanidad por su arte colonial, su, su arquitectura, pero también por su rico patrimonio cultural y material. I'm going to present a case study of Antigua Guatemala, which is uh, one of our UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Guatemala, and it is uh, not only a monument for humanity, but also a very uh, community that has, uh, it is very well known for the rich uh, Uh, intangible co uh, cultural heritage, especially during the Holy Week, uh, especialmente eh, durante la Semana Santa en la Antigua, eh, que fue cuando llegó la pandemia aquí alrededor del 16 de marzo, hace un par de tres meses ya casi, eh, coincidía con las celebraciones de la Semana Santa en Antigua y eh, lamentablemente estas expresiones eh, culturales de la comunidad no pudieron ser expresadas en esta ocasión. So, the, the pandemic arrived right at the time of the Holy Week, the, Easter, the Holy Week in, in Latin America, I mean, worldwide. But in Antigua Guatemala, it is very famous because uh, of all the expressions, you know, carpets, uh, processions, uh, and a lot of intangible cultural heritage goes around. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic, Uh, this uh, was for first time in the hi in history cancelled, and and that was very very uh, very strange. Uh, as you can see, uh, um, the the rich uh, expressions of. Uh, I'm sorry, Jamie. I have a problem with the slide. I think you're also moving. Okay. So. Um, This can give you an idea of the, the amounts of people that can gather for the Holy Week. Esta fotografía les puede dar una idea de el, la cantidad de, de participación eh, al, de la comunidad, no solo de la antigua, sino gente de, vienen comunidades de todo el país y de otros países a celebrar la Semana Santa. Y este año, pues, se vio totalmente afectado. So, um, This year was totally affected, and uh, these slides uh, can show you, um, the previous slides uh, will give you an idea of the amount of people that gets involved in these festivities and uh, the contrast of today. This is the impact, the, the slides I, I'm showing now show you how dead Antigua is. Las, las fotografías que estoy presentando en el momento eh, son, corresponden a la situación actual en la Antigua Guatemala, 
la cual es una comunidad que vive 100% del turismo. Tenemos 14 semanas de estar cerrados, no solo los museos, sino las plazas, los espacios libres, en lo cual ha creado un gran impacto en la economía eh, de, y, y estamos muy preocupados del impacto social que se viene en las próximas semanas. So this is an idea of how empty Antigua Guatemala is. It's a, a, a full tourism uh, uh, community. We depend on tourism and uh, unfortunately now it's a ghost town and uh, we have been 14 weeks in lockdown and the economy is really, really bad and we are very concerned about the common social issues that uh, this will bring. So uh, you can see that all the plazas are closed. Aquí pueden ver que todas las plazas uh, comunitarias están cerradas. Y, uh, can you go through the next slide, uh, Jamie? So, uh, esta diapositiva muestra la situación de este año. Eh, esta misma fachada, el mismo día, hace un año, estaba con 3.000 personas. Este año habrían, si muchos, 20 personas. O sea, la, uh, this is a facade of a church that if it was a normal Easter, uh, we would have 3,000 people. The same day, same time, this year, there were only 20 people. And uh, it can give you an idea of the impact of... Uh, of uh, this situation. Same with this other church. Uh, you know, there's still people who has faith, but uh, you know, in order to keep doing these uh, carpets and, and trying to dress up as uh, they would do in the Easter week. Uh, but you can see it's a very dramatic scene. So estas fotografías nos pueden dar una idea de lo dramático que ha sido esta Semana Santa eh, en Antigua. Y eh, también el impacto que ha tenido eh, durante la Semana Santa, pero también se muestra eh, la fe de, de nuestra comunidad de tratar de mantener la tradición viva. Eh, igual, otra situación de otra, de otra iglesia, eh, donde eh, normalmente sale el Santo Entierro, el Viernes Santo, y este año pues estuvo totalmente... Eh, eh, muerto, como lo vemos en esta diapositiva. Así es que, eh, vamos a ver. Eh, esto no solo afecta eh, la gente que participa eh, cargando o haciendo las, las tradiciones, sino es toda una cadena de personas que se ven afectadas. Eh, creadores de patrimonio inmaterial, digamos, la gastronomía tradicional, que es parte de estas tradiciones, también se vio afectada. All these gastronomic uh, issues that uh, are, go along with the, with the Holy Week uh, celebrations were also affected. Um, because, uh, you know, people, uh, it's, uh, they come from different, con uh, from different areas and countries, so there's a lot of street food vendors that... Uh, you know, that provide uh, food and beverage for, for the crowds. So, se vieron afectadas todas estas personas que normalmente ahorran, invierten para, para tener algo de comida y venderlo durante la Semana Santa, uh, pero este año, pues, eh, todo el mundo se vio afectado, no hubo nada de eso. En las comunidades indígenas de Guatemala, eh, que son más del, aproximadamente un 50% de nuestra eh, población también eh, hubo mucho impacto, ya que también en las comunidades indígenas eh, se celebra la Semana Santa, como pueden ver, aquí pues es una expresión en uno de nuestros mayores eh, pueblos eh, quichés, eh, de las comunidades indígenas más fuertes del país. So, commun uh, indigenous communities were also affected because they also have their own celebrations, They also celebrate the Holy Week as we do in Antigua, uh, maybe not with the same expressions, but uh, they also have their own uh, very, very unique uh, expressions where they combine uh, syncretic uh, practices, you know, from ancestral uh, elders, like uh, uh, they, they uh, 
they combine the Catholic uh, practices with um, with the syncretic Mayan uh, religion practice. Uh, Jamie, can I go through the next slide, please? I lost the arrow. So there are deities like this doctor. This is the doctor, Mashimon. Mashimon is the old grandfather. You know, he can heal you. He can heal the pandemic. He can forecast the pandemic according to, to, the, to, the, to the elders. So a lot of people are now going to, to back to, to the old doctor, you know, to, to find an answer. So this is an ancestral knowledge. And these deities, these syncretic deities of indigenous people, are, 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 are again being revalorated. Re so, esta, esta deidad que vemos aquí es una deidad sincrética de los indígenas mayas de Guatemala y le llaman el doctor, el juez, el licenciado. El doctor tiene poderes para curar y muchas uh, personas están yendo a, a su clínica, digamos, en el que está ubicada en el altiplano, para. Eh, como un recurso posible para poder combatir la pandemia. Entonces, este es un momento también para estas deidades y estas riquezas de patrimonio material de volver a rescatarse, de volver a tener una función como la que tuvieron originalmente. So this is an opportunity for all these deities and for all these beliefs that uh, to rescue the ancestral uh, knowledge in order to find solutions and to find a better way of living and, uh, and try to combine them with the new, the new scientific technology. So, um, because like we see in these photographs, this involves not only uh, one activity, but it's all the clothing, the, the food, uh, you know, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of expressions that are being affected, the artisans, the, the the, the, the ceremonial rituals that the, these people practices. Um, todas estas tradiciones están siendo seriamente afectadas, ya que existen ferias eh, patronales donde se ven los, se lucen las, la, la indumentaria ceremonial, salen las deidades sincréticas, eh, participa la comunidad, uh, las fiestas patronales también, que solo este mes de junio tenemos tres fiestas, San Antonio, mañana, eh, San Juan el 24, San Pedro el 29, y este año no vamos a tener danzas tradicionales ni lo acostumbrado. So in the Christian festivals, Christian saint festivals uh, that take place uh, uh, the, the whole year, uh, we are not celebrating it the same way, I'm afraid. Uh, for example, this month of June we have three major uh, festivals, or uh, tomorrow is the day of San Anthony, uh, June 24th is St. John's and the 29th is St. Peter. So, uh, so um, unfortunately, these have been affected. Those are occasions where we see the best of the communities, traditional clothing, traditional dance, and uh, food, traditional food. And, uh, you know, this has all been canceled. So this affects everyone, you know, the dancers, the mask makers, the costume makers, uh, flour, uh, gunpowder, uh, uh, you know, uh, all the elements that, that are used. Um, todos los elementos que se utilizan en estos festivales también están siendo afectados. Los artesanos que, que confeccionan los trajes de las danzas, las máscaras, eh, el, el, las decoraciones de las procesiones, los músicos, eh, todo, todo esto pues ha sido cancelado eh, durante ¿no? un, un tiempo indefinido y ya solo en este mes de junio pues... Eh, parece que ya está sonando la alarma del tiempo. Eh, hay tradiciones, por ejemplo, está en el cementerio, el Día de los Muertos. Hoy no podemos ni enterrar a un muerto más de 10 personas. Cuando estamos acostumbrados a ir al cementerio, volar barriletes, llevar música, eh, oír toda la familia, llevarle música cuando hay un funeral. This time, uh, we are very, um, very um, frustrated uh, since we can also not uh, conduct our, these practices at the cemetery, for example. Uh, 
Uh, now, we, like I said before, we are having our funerals with very few people. Uh, when we are used to, to take music to the festivals, to fly kites, and now, you know, this is, a, you know, this has a very uh, strong impact. So it is very important for uh, community museums also to, can I go to the next slide, please, Jamie? <laughs> Okay. So, um, I would like to conclude, quisiera con, eh, eh, concluir, eh, pues solo resaltando y después de exponer todo esta, este material, eh, pues la importancia y el reto que tenemos los museos comunitarios en rescatar estos valores. Ya se ha mencionado con los ponentes anteriores, pues el, las diferentes formas como podemos hacerlo, yo creo que en eso estamos todos conectados y de acuerdo, y pues ese es el reto, de que los museos comunitarios ahora no solo sean transmisores, sino también receptores de, de toda esa información para poder eh, motivar a la comunidad a rescatar esa identidad cultural que hemos perdido por la globalización, especialmente aquí en Antigua Guatemala, ya estábamos en un extremo de perder toda la identidad cultural, ¿verdad? con eh, negocios, letreros en inglés, eh, todo tipo de, de desvirtualización de nuestra identidad, lo cual es una oportunidad también para la antigua, para el alcalde, para reconstruir un patrimonio tangible eh, como quisiéramos todos. So, to conclude, I would say that this is a... a and a great opportunity for museums to be receptors, not only transmitters of, uh, uh, of uh, knowledge. And it is, uh, again, a unique opportunity to rescue the, our cultural identities, you know, to, to gather, to, to rescue, to protect the, the elders, to protect, to create supporting programs for the elders, like human living treasures in Asia programs, you know, they, they support these bearers of knowledge, which is very important. And this will make us think, I think uh, some, we have to look at the, at the opportunities that this pandemic has given to the community museums, uh, because now community museums will have a, a first row uh, role in, in, in the museum's uh, scenario. Muchas gracias, thank you very much. Querido Samuel, muchísimas gracias por su intervención. Las fotos han sido bellísimas. Thank you, Samuel, for your wonderful um, talk today. The photographs have been absolutely beautiful. We get to see your skills at play once again. Um, and you've made very many of the participants and audience members quite happy with those images. Um, we're going to try with Luis Raposo once more, um, who promises that he has a bit better bandwidth right now. And if that doesn't work, we will go immediately into his audio. So, Luis. Yes, are, you. You, are you hearing me now? Are you, yes, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. I have no video uh, image, but I think that's no matter about. No. Uh, well, uh, let me say a little comment. Uh, uh, this is the, the reason. Uh, situation uh, all, all around and museums will also um, in a way suffer but also have the opportunities uh, on that. Uh, the future of museums in my view is not so dramatic. A lot of people nowadays, special in uh, Europe uh, where I'm being um, with I concerns relating museums. I'm not so concerned as that. Uh, museums have already uh, suffered immensely uh, from crisis, and they, they had survived. They, they survived, and they will survive, I, I think. But of course, there are some museums which will suffer immensely. These are mainly the ones which had, in recent years, let themselves be taken by the so-called market. Or I would prefer to say, to say the casino culture uh, paradigm, who's, who's uh, using the George Steiner uh, words, the idea of promoting events for maximal impact in, and instant obsolescence, aiming to create important financial flows, of course, appropriated, by, appropriate these flows by investors and uh, as profits. 
um, like had any other profits in the, in the stock market. This is also what Theodor Adorno named the fetishism of cultural goods, following Karl Marx and other earlier philosophers referring the fetishism of objects. Among these market-oriented museums, the most wanted ones will be, and in fact, in fact, are being the, the ones depending on mass tourism revenues. Um, in, together with all other museums oriented to occasional visitors, uh, mostly in towns and large agglomerates, these, will, these museums, depending on uh, uh, revenues from tourism and occasional visitors, will be forced to reinvent themselves, which is not bad, necessarily bad. On the contrary, I think, the, to program exhibitions really to be seen with time and sense of long-standing rejoice is undoubtedly better for me than to promote blockbuster blockbuster events focused focus on the way on the way which uh, on great masters see and represent the air, the air the year or the nose of, the nose of certain personages. Yet, other possible answers to the crisis crisis by these museums can be much more disputable, being the digitalization one of them. Nowadays, everyone fo uh, uh, speaks about digital and digitalization. And uh, many people is attacked by the digital as a possible uh, development for museums. Of course, I agree that digital is important for museums, but what will maybe happen as an alternative for, uh, um, these, uh, for those museums, the more, these museums which I have referred before, is to develop light and sound spectacles. Immersive, immersive in such a way that we lost contact with reality inside them. I doubt personally very much that this could be adequate, both conceptually and practically speaking, a, a, a path for museums, a way for museums to, 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 to proceed. And of course, they're, they're, these kind of spectacles will not be affordable for most museums. But in each country, museums in such conditions, museums depending on the market, are largely minority, minority. Even if the odd spot of the market tends to install the opposite idea, especially among political deciders and investors. In Portugal, for instance, to give you my own, uh, my, uh, my country example, we um, believe that there are uh, 600 museums or the double of things which call themselves museums not being so. But from these 600, half of them are really museums with all conditions to be co named uh, called museums and classified museums by the ICOM definition. Uh, and half of this half, about 30, 300 museums, are already inside certified and inside a network of museums uh, validated uh, uh, network. So most of these hundreds of museums are not museums uh, depending on the market in, as I have uh, in initially uh, expressed. They still are museums in the basic sense of being museum. After, uh, since museums have been reinvented in the 17th century after the French revolutions. They are citizen developmental tools. And this is the basic definition for museum. Among these uh, museums, uh, which see, see themselves as citizen development, developmental engines, the ones which are in the front line are museums who claim to be close to uh, people, uh, related to people. I prefer to say people than communities. Or then I would say communities where everyone knows almost anyone, any other, where the sharing of everyday life common resources is still ongoing. Neighbors in some more than in, in some more than communities. For these museums uh, of neighbors, museums of communities in the neighbor in the, in the neighboring sense, for this COVID nineteen crisis can be seen as an opportunity to better perceive their relevance, and this relevance is favored by the time uh, in which this crisis occurs, a time when state traditional functions are, and services are being dismantled a time when extreme neoliberal conceptions of life tend to read as public services in education, in health, in communications, and so on. This is so the perfect time for museums re-emerge as community devices, places for assembling, 
as they usually are in all crises, either humanly made, like wars, as naturally originated. And also places for building a future where economics and cultural dimensions of, of life are linked in, in order to promote what the ancients called felicitas, happiness in the sense of the enjoy of life. In order to achieve these goals, uh, I had in recent years been calling, uh, and before the, the, the COVID crisis, I was already been calling attention for the, advent the advantage in widening the already ancient, to decades is a long time, concept of GLAM. A GLAM is an acronym standing for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. GLAM, this concept of GLAM, began at a merely technical cooperative level. level aiming to create software and other resources allowing for interchange of databases and communication in general. Well, it is in my view time to evolve from GLAM to GLAM plus conception, to a GLAM plus conception, especially in small localities where state services did disappear. Postal services, for instance, have been priv privatized in most European countries and are scarce or literally non-existent in most villages. Some, uh, the, the same occurs with health, health centers. In some museums, in uh, uh, Hungary, for instance, in Eastern Europe, in several countries in Eastern Europe, doctors in medicine consult patients in museums, especially in specialties where consultation occurs once or twice a month. There are no health center in the village and the museum can fulfill that need. As you see in this diagram now, showing for some minutes ago, traditional GLAM services can be asked to include these other dimensions, press and web center, coffee shop, mail and post service, fiscal assistance, healthy services, and so on. Museums possess ideal conditions to, ass to assure these services in, in small uh, localities. They have installations, commitment, with public well-being, often they have also centrality in the village and so on. The exact geometry of this model will certainly be extremely variable. In some places, like in this second slide, and please go ahead with second, well, it is already now. Uh, in some places, like in this second slide, the museum can indeed be the booster institution. And the coffee, the press, or the mailing services can be the most appreciated uh, resources. But in other localities, as in, in this third slide, now the following slide, please. Um, um, uh, please go ahead with the following slide, Jamie. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, the, the, uh, in other localities, like in this third slide, centrality will be attributed to the library being the health center, the most evaluated service, and the museum just a subsidiary institution, maybe no more than a curator, a mediator, or a conservator, restorator. It will always depend on what people, communities of neighbors, as, you, as I prefer to name, need and ask for. Two, two only final remarks I, uh, are worthy to note. First, we need not worry uh, like many of my colleague, colleagues, professionals of museums worry about, I think we did not worry in, if in such process museums can disappear by sub subsuming them, themselves to other institutions, the library, the archive, uh, whatever, the cultural center in general. Museums, like any other social construct, are only needed if useful. Life is composed by birth and death. The death of museums must be seen as natural, so natural as their birth. So don't be anxious about the death of museums in this frame, because it can occur indeed. If required to continue museums, uh, but on the contrary, if museums are required to continue, then they have, they, they have to keep to be museums, meaning, they have to keep fulfilling needs that no others can equally assure. And this signifies that museums must be museums. They must keep their uniqueness, which, um, saying it briefly, is collections, collection curatorship. 
All other social roles are welcomed, of course, within this referred Global Plus frame. But if no specific museum's expertise is required, then better to close the museum. There will be uh, an unnecessary and expense loss of time. Museums define themselves by being museums, not by being exactly the same which any other cultural institution or research could, can also fulfill. And like in individuals, also in museums, there is no worse behavior than want, that wanting to impose its present when nobody claims for it. So let's uh, face the future of community museums, of small museums, museums in small localities with optimism. I'm very much optimist, optimistic, but in a broader sense than the traditional museums. If in, in the course, in the, the, in the, during this process, museums became at the end became unuseful, they will disappear naturally. No problem about. If the centrality of uh, in, in, a, in a village or other village in a, a community or other community centrality is still the museum, a collection of memories uh, uh, translated into objects, mobile objects or um, forests or uh, landscapes, and uh, that specific uh, expertise is needed to curate those uh, collections, then the museum is still needed and will be there. But uh, if uh, the library, the cultural center, the, the parish, the parish uh, is uh, considered the most important and central um, community tool, let's, let's evolve in that direction and let uh, the museum naturally uh, end because they have been created and they will end uh, in any monument in the future. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Luis. Uh, we greatly appreciate um, your, your presentation. And um, we thank everybody for the patience in getting us worked out with the technical difficulties. Um, at this point, we're gonna pass into the question and answers period, um, but not without first mentioning that we have learned from this, our first webinar experience, that we do need to make sure that our subsequent um, webinars happen uh, in a bilingual format. Entonces, eh, agradecemos mucho a Luis por su intervención eh, y queríamos nada más comentar antes de eh, progresar al periodo de preguntas y respuestas eh, que para la próxima, eh, el próximo webinario tenemos muy claro que es absolutamente necesario eh, trabajar de forma bilingüe. Así que eh, nos disculpamos esta vez por solo tener traducción en, eh, para algunos de nuestros panelistas y en el futuro lo vamos a tener eh, para todos. Um, so yes, now we're going to move into the question and answer period. Um, the, we've received a variety of different questions and are now getting a few more. Um, so we're actually going to, some of them were addressed to specific um, panelists, I will mention those panelists, but we also are delighted to have any of you um, respond. Cualquiera puede responder a las preguntas, aun si eh, haya sido res, eh, eh, presentado para uno de los panelistas, panelistas en particular. Entonces, um, I do want to begin with uh, this first question, a very brief question um, regarding, because Teresa might be able to answer it and she does have to leave earlier. So we received one question of, um, from Brazil about whether or not um, there are any Brazilian museums connected to the Red de Museos Comunitarios and um, if you know anything about this. Yes, uh, yes to answer that question. Several museums from Brazil and representatives of museums have participated in events uh, that the network has organized, uh, but they haven't uh, affiliated. They haven't become affiliated yet to the to the network. So it's a it's a question in progress, and I think uh, it's a, it's a process for different uh, museums to learn about and to see if they identify with the the. Uh, the philosophy of the network that uh, that I described. 
So yeah, that's something that's possible, but it hasn't happened quite yet. All right, thank you very much. Um, on to our next question. This was uh, addressed to um, Hugh de Varin, but again, any of, of you guys are welcome to answer. Um, the question is, how can we protect our museums in times of war and terrorism attacks? Kind of a tough question. This is from Dr. Radwan. I don't know if anybody has something to say about this. Well, um, if uh, Mr. Devarin uh, is not around, I, uh, I can't help. Si no está respondiendo, yo puedo Gracias, Amor. Um, I think uh, you can, uh, you have to prepare, you have to create a, um, a plan, an emergency plan, a preparation plan for these uh, social or war uh, cases. Uh, but the, this plan, we have to have clear that it will only be good to mitigate uh, the, the, the issue. I mean, it is impossible to, to stop, you know, the total damage uh, as any any other uh, agent like earthquake or or uh, flood, you know, emergency plans are for um, planning. And uh, if in, in case of a war or social protest, uh, we have an advantage that maybe we have time to evacuate, uh, which is not the case in an earthquake. So uh, there are a, a lot of evacuation plans and manuals that uh, can help again, to mitigate the situation. And uh, that's the only thing you can do. You, know, you have to be prepared, evacuate your priority objects of the collection, make sure you're, of course, human lives are the priority, but once you have control of that, you must have an evacuation plan uh, and also uh, a safe place where to take these objects uh, in, and the whole process, the transportation and so on. Entonces, mi respuesta es, mi sugerencia o recomendación, ya que trabajo en gestión de riesgos, es que los planes de emergencia que se sugiere que cada institución haga tienen que ser a su medida, y por supuesto, estos planes de emergencia son únicamente para mitigar o reducir el daño que pueda causar el agente de deterioro. Una, uh, un conflicto armado, una guerra o una protesta social tiene la ventaja que puede hasta cierta forma predecirse o uno o la institución puede conocer la situación unos días o con su, eh, pues a veces horas antes, a veces es sorpresivo, pero eh, la ventaja es que tenemos un margen de tiempo para prepararnos y principalmente evacuar, evacuar nuestras piezas val, eh, valiosas, nuestros objetos valiosos de la colección a un lugar seguro. Pero todo esto tiene que ser eh, 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 coordinado con un plan de emergencia anterior a la emergencia para poder eh, actuar eh, y mitigar eh, la mayor eh, parte posible de la colección. Um, thank you very much, Samuel. And actually, um, Dr. Radwan has actually raised his hand, so we're going to let him. Um, speak because we have the capability of doing that. So, Jamie, go for it. And uh, Dr. Radwan, we're delighted to hear from you. Okay, if you unmute your microphone, that should be able to do it. Okay, I think we have a slight problem with the connection. Okay, I think it's best to continue, Lauren. Sorry, I will keep going then. Um, our, our next question is, I think, a very pertinent question for all of us, all museum professionals. Um, this comes from Emma Jackson, and she asks, how do we keep this cultural connectivity momentum ongoing as the world goes back to normal? And of course, we have no idea what that normal is, but um, certainly, uh, it's a good question. How soon do we think that this normal will happen? Um, or is this the dawning of a new age? So I guess the question is particularly this part about how do we maintain the momentum going? 
perdón, debería de formular las preguntas en español para que Beatriz eh, pueda responder. Esta pregunta es para todos y la pregunta es cómo podemos mantener esta conectividad cultural, o sea, el, el, toda la energía que está sucediendo ahora con esta interconectividad cultural que se está dando, ¿cómo lo podemos mantener después de que volviera que sea sanado normalidad? O si pensamos que es una nueva era que está surgiendo. Eh, And this is open to all panelists, I don't know if anybody has a specific... Samuel, can you unmute your microphone? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, if I could just uh, speak to that briefly. I, you know, I, for uh, the networks that we participate in, there was a, a process of communicating by phone and sort of training people to, to see how they could, you know, get Zoom on their computer or on their phone. It was a, a, process, a training process. but And so that, I think, is something that's probably going to be ongoing now. People will learn how to handle these, these different tools. And once they've learned them, you can continue to use them. They're not, um, it's a process that's, I think probably has opened up uh, uh, possibilities of communication and to keep them going, it's basically keeping a certain rhythm uh, because if, if communication doesn't happen uh, in a fluid way, people feel like it's just not worth it. So it, it needs to be something that's, uh, that's coming and going at a certain rhythm. And it also needs to be something relevant, I think, that people want to respond to, that they feel speak to their situation. So I think those are things that are important to keep this momentum. And I imagine that this is probably something that can stay and be a complement to the face-to-face -face interactions we can have later on. Hopefully we will have later on. It'll be crucial to have. We can't substitute uh, that connection by internet. But uh, It probably is a compliment, at least in, I, in my view, that will will be here and will be a, an important resource. Entonces, pues digo, nada más muy rápidamente que considero que es un recurso que la gente se ha capacitado, ha habido un proceso de aprendizaje del manejo de estas herramientas y que ya ya que ocurrió y ya la gente se está conectando, creo que va a ser un complemento de las estrategias de comunicación. Eh, añadido a, a la interacción cara a cara, que es fundamental, no puede ser sustituida, pero que este, esto pues, nos abre una posibilidad. Y para mantener el momento de esto, pues es importante cierto ritmo de comunicación y la relevancia de lo que se está comunicando para que la gente realmente siente que vale la pena, ¿no? Entonces, bueno, son factores a considerar, pero sí nos abre unas posibilidades y es cuestión de, de sostenerlos sin abandonar. Muchas gracias, Teresa. Samuel, ¿usted quería comentar algo? Sí, quería agregar de alguna manera eh, eh, a la respuesta dada por Teresa, que sin lugar a duda esta comunicación digital es un recurso. Eh, sin embargo, creo que al igual como Samuel señala que tiene que ver con el espacio, con el lugar, para construir un, un, una línea comunicacional específica. Hay que reconocer la situación, el contexto en donde está emplazado, y eso eh, pienso el público que, que, a que, con quien hay que conectarse. Pienso que eso marca diferencia entre unas instituciones y otras. El fortalecer la línea comunicacional, la vinculación con el público tiene particularidades en, en cada una de las instituciones y creo que la construcción eh, que nos permite eh, fortalecer la comunicación eh, de la, la nueva tecnología es un, sin, sin lugar a duda, como dice Teresa, es un importante recurso que hay que tenerlo presente en el desarrollo museológico futuro. Um, yeah, can I translate that for you? Anna, please do. Okay, so she is adding uh, that she agrees that digital communication is a very valuable resource. However, also, as Samuel says, there's um, 
space to build a specific communication line that belongs to a particular context. And that context can be very different between institutions. So the idea of strengthening this communication line and this relationship with uh, the public, with the audience is different across institutions. And new technologies are important resources for future mythological developments. Thank you, Anna, very much. Um, I'm going to move on to, uh, or someone, did you, wanted to res did you want to respond to something? All right, go for it. Can I say something quickly? Do some way. Um, okay, I'm going to, yes, please. Yeah, it's just a, um, a couple of people are still asking questions to Huda Vereen. And I'd like to explain that Hugh de Verin has, has had to leave the meeting for now. And also that um, Teresa Morales needs to meet, leave the meeting in five or 10 minutes. So if there are any specific questions for Teresa, this is your last chance. <laughs> thank you. All right, um, thank you very much, Karen. I'm gonna uh, move forward to the next question that we received that, um, uh just wait hold on sorry about that um this is kind of a long comment so i'm going to read it all out um in los museos, it's in spanish in los museos comunitarios en los que existe incertidumbre sobre la continuidad de la, la institución se ha planteado ya alguna medida de dónde va a ir o qué se va a hacer con la colección que alberga? A, a very interesting question. So we know that many community museums are in peril of possibly closing. Does anybody have any response regarding um, what any plans that are being made around um, the safeguarding of those collections? If anybody has any um, response. Teresa, please. Can I just respond very, very briefly to this? Uh, at least the community museums that, that we're in touch with, they're not really in a risk of closing because I think, as Hugh said very uh, accurately at the beginning of his uh, intervention, community museums don't really depend that much uh, on uh, external support or tourism, at least the ones that, that uh, we're, we're involved with. So. Uh, they depend on community people being interested in sustaining them, and that hasn't changed. So the collections are there. Uh, in the cases that uh, we're in touch with, the, the, the community groups are maintaining the museums without having them open to the public. <clears throat> and uh, I think they're, they're, they're not going to be closed. They're just uh, in standby. And of course, it's an, it's an effort to uh, maintain the installations and so forth. But it's something that uh, doesn't put them at risk of being closed at, at the moment. So, uh, nada más estoy comentando brevemente que los museos comunitarios, como dijo Hugh de Berín, realmente dependen del de compromiso y el trabajo comunitario, y eso no ha cambiado en los museos que nosotros conocemos, es, están sosteniendo, hay ese compromiso. Entonces, la gente no abre el museo al público, pero mantiene la colección y conserva lo esencial de, de lo que es el edificio de las colecciones. Entonces, este, creo que en ese sentido no hay un, un riesgo eminente, ¿no? No sé si la otra, las otras participantes pueden eh, mencionar otras situaciones, pero es lo que yo conozco. Does anybody else want to respond to that? Maybe Samuel, do you have any ideas of what's going on there in Guatemala? Sí. Or Luis? Sí, eh, efectivamente, bueno, el, en primer lugar yo pienso que... Eh, la definición de museo comunitario es muy amplia. O sea, eh, hay muchas situaciones, mu muchas circunstancias eh, pues que, que ahora nos van a, a, a cuestionar pues, de, de, la de exactamente cuál es, se va a crear una nueva definición en base a las responsabilidades. O sea, en Latinoamérica incluso existen diferentes versiones de lo que es un museo comunitario. Entonces, hay diferentes situaciones de cómo se está reaccionando y manejando el tema. Pero, en, en, concretamente, en base a la, a, para responder la pregunta, yo diría, como dijo Teresa, que las colecciones no, en realidad no, no están en peligro, no se está moviendo nada. Es más, se está fortaleciendo. 
eh, en el caso de las comunidades indígenas de Guatemala y eh, que, que tienen pequeños museos comunitarios, digamos, ellos mismos tienen sus, sus sistemas de autodefensa, se han aislado, o sea, respetan las regulaciones eh, go del gobierno, pero tienen sus propias regulaciones municipales de acuerdo a, a, la, a lo que llamamos la alcaldía indígena, eh, que ellos tienen sus propias leyes también, y muchos museos comunitarios dependen de estas municipalidades o, o en, en cierta forma están vinculadas a estas municipalidades. Sin embargo, la situación no es la misma en Antigua o en la ciudad, en las metrópolis más grandes, que también pueden haber museos comunitarios, pero eh, su función eh, no es similar a la que está, o sea, su, su, eh, la forma, su operación, diría, no es... El, eh, no necesariamente es igual a la de las comunidades. So I, I was saying that uh, to answer the question uh, uh, as Teresa mentioned, um, you know, uh, collections are not being moved anywhere uh, because they are not in danger. I mean, this is not an earthquake, this is not a flood. Uh, I mean, they are safer where they are. I mean, actually, it is better not to touch the collection, you know, because uh, so. Uh, but basically, it is the, the operational issue that, uh, uh, of, the, of the community museums that will change. And as I said, community museums, it's a very, uh, very vague or re abstract uh, definition. I mean, we tried with the EULAC project to try to define what a community museum is because in Europe is one thing. Even in Latin America, we have three, four different concepts of what a community museum is. So, but basically, collections are the same. It is basically the, opera the operative uh, uh, activities that uh, will have some, may have some uh, uh, modifications uh, uh, according to their municipal or national governments. But I think, uh, like, in my, uh, like I said in my presentation, this is a good opportunity for all community museums to, to really uh, be born again and, and be really stars in this in this moment you know it is very important uh, thank you very much Samuel um, we're going to try to bring somebody else in with the audio I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do that um, is is Rodrigo available Perhaps we can we can try to get him um, uh, available, and I will keep going forward with some of the rest of the questions. Um, we've had many different questions regarding uh, the um, the ideas. Uh, so sorry. Um, We've had questions regarding digitization and the fact that we're all going virtual. Some of the questions are related to whether or not there are any um, uh, resources out there to help community museums in digitizing. Other questions regard um, the concern of the um, disparity in resources. Again, an issue of financing. So what, what um, if there are any other um, solutions the community museums have come up with if they're unable to face the the challenge of funding the needs for virtual uh, to go virtual to go digital. Entonces, la pregunta es: eh, hemos recibido varios comentarios sobre eh, la importancia de digitalizar y virtualizar nuestros museos, eh, pero definitivamente hay una preocupación por el poder financiar. Este, estos medios eh, que ciertamente eh, pues hay una, una discrepancia entre la capacidad de un museo pequeño comunitario y los grandes museos entonces la pregunta es si han habido eh, algunas otras alternativas que se hayan presentado en estos tiempos eh, considerando esa realidad Perhaps I should phrase the, the question again in English because I was bringing it together in my mind. Um, so the concern is um, that we all know that there is a disparity between access to, to digital and virtual, uh, virtual technologies. And so if anybody is aware of any other uh, strategies that community museums or any museums have come up with to deal with the current situation when they're unable to uh, go virtual or go digital, and if there's any resources available for that. 
And if nobody feels the desire to respond to that question, I will um, move on. Uh, are you, are you I just hearing, wanted to. Are you hearing yes. me? Yes. I hear you. Are you, are you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I would say that um, um, in the last two or three years, there has been some calls of DigiConnect on Horizon 2020 to the digitalization of cultural heritage. There has been a call this year. So we still don't know the work program for next year, but just look into it, be aware to look into the work program to see if there are new calls about digitization, digitalization of cultural heritage. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. And I would like to just briefly mention um, that Rodrigo is, uh, Rodrigo Martí is our um, EU project officer for the EU LAC Museums um, project. So thank you so much, Rodrigo, for, for accompanying us today. And um, perhaps you would like to just mention what you wrote in your in your comment regarding um, readiness for terrorist attacks. And yeah, no, I wrote that it's, it's very important to have a digitalization of the collections because I know it well. Some of you know that I was in my previous life, I was archaeologist in Syria. So I'm following very closely what is happening in Syria. And I'm in contact with many Syrian archaeologists. And the big drama of many things that have been destroyed is that they had not been digitalized. Because if they had been digitalized now, I mean, we don't know whether or not it would be possible to reconstruct and restore, but at, at least we would have not lost all the information that we have lost. So there are two important elements to help for future restoration and to have all the information, not only the digitalization of the objects and the buildings, but also of all the information that goes with it. I don't know if you want me to tell it in Spanish. Sí, por favor, Rodrigo. <laughs> vale. Sí, no, lo que digo es que es muy bueno. Eh, yo conozco bien este tema porque he sido arqueólogo y he trabajado en Siria. Entonces, viendo la destrucción del patrimonio histórico sirio e iraquí, uno de los grandes dramas es que hay muchos elementos que no estaban digitalizados. Si se hubiesen digitalizado antes, sería mucho más fácil ahora tener elementos importantes para la restauración, por un lado, y por otro lado, la información que se ha perdido no se hubiera perdido. Por ejemplo, imaginaros en un museo simplemente uh, el estudio morfológico de la cerámica que se conserva. Eso se podía haber digitalizado y ahí estaría. No se hubiera perdido. Era una, es un ejemplo. Muchísimas gracias, Rodrigo, Beatriz. Sí, quería, quería hacer una observación eh, frente a la pregunta del poder financiar. Creo que esta, esta crisis nos ha mostrado que efectivamente los medios tecnológicos son un excelente... Eh, una excelente medida para mantener comunicado. Sin embargo, pienso que también depende del tipo de museo es el que acoge o no acoge esta tecnología, porque de pronto hay museos comunitarios que pertenecen a ciertos grupos étnicos que podrían, por, por su cultura, por sus tradiciones, no estar de acuerdo con esas tecnologías. Entonces, creo que es una decisión que tiene que tomar eh, la, la, el grupo que, que decide en, esta, en, el, en los museos comunitarios el uso de tecnología o no, o simplemente seguir en esa relación directa con la comunidad, con sus objetos patrimoniales y con su ritualidad. Eh, sin embargo, eh, me parece que, tal como lo dije al comienzo, esta, esta tecnología es un gran apoyo tal como señaló anteriormente Rodrigo, eh, no solo para la comunicación, sino también para el registro de bienes patrimoniales y para muchas otras actividades que los museos desarrollan. Eso. Eh, anudado a eso, tenemos a alguien, eh, que Carlos Velázquez pregunta eh, también si alguien tiene conocimiento de museos comunitarios que, hayan, que se hayan acercado a corporaciones de internet 
eh, para poder acceder a, a, a internet gratuito o algún tipo de, de plataforma web subsidi eh, subsidiado, eh, si conocen algunas experiencias de esa, de esa relación en donde los museos comunitarios se apadrinan eh, con eh, otros, otras entidades. Uh, let me ask the question in English. Um, we received a question regarding um, internet access and the difficulty that some smaller museums or community museums may have. If any of you have awareness or knowledge of um, examples where uh, museums have um, come into a relationship with larger corporations to be able to gain access or digital platforms uh, for their museums, if any of you know of this. Um, I think we can just comment at this point that Webinar 3 is devoted to the subject of, of technology also. All right, thank you. So I'm going to move of, uh, forward with a question uh, that's specific to, to Beatriz, um, because many people asked and commented during her presentation. Uh, and it's a question regarding her having mentioned the burning of the Museum of Violeta Parra. Entonces, esta pregunta es específica para Beatriz, pero muchísima gente respondió durante su intervención eh, sobre... Las, los incendios en el Museo Violeta Parra. Entonces, quizás nos puedes comentar algo de eso, que la gente no, no quedó claro si eso era eh, específicamente un resultado de la crisis o, o qué fue el asunto. Sí, eh, eso fue eh, durante el transcurso de los, de los estallidos, de las protestas, de los estallidos sociales. En las protestas, en de octubre específicamente, eh, si bien es cierto, el millón doscientos personas que salieron el 19 de octubre a la calle iban en forma pacífica, sin embargo hay pequeños grupos que son muy violentistas y que con el correr del tiempo han ido eh, adquiriendo eh, esta, esta acción frente a una serie de... Eh, de bienes patrimoniales y, y, y ciudadanos. Entonces, tal como señalé cuando, cuando mostramos la imagen, eh, el museo está emplazado a, a poca distancia del foco central de las protestas y eh, fue, fue quemado, así como fueron quemados un, un hotel en, en el otro contorno de, de la calle, eh, fueron quemados y... La, la, el edificio en su totalidad, los interiores y todo, eh, está en desuso. ¿no? Fue quemado tres veces, tres veces se provocaron incendios. Afortunadamente, la primer, el primer incendio eh, no alcanzó a entrar al, al edificio en sí, sino que solo en una parte, lo que puso en alerta a la dirección y a los administrativos y la colección se sacó toda la colección eh, fue guardada en otro recinto. Eh, pero después, eh, todas las instalaciones del museo están absolutamente deterioradas. Perdón, Beatriz, pero Ana. Yes, it's okay. I got it. Ah, pues, um, no, no okay. So the fire was during the social revolt, the social protest in October and uh, hundreds of people and most were peaceful protesters but not everyone so some small groups have uh, acted against cultural heritage and as she showed in her presentation the museum is located close to the focus of the protest uh, another hotel nearby was also burned and the museum building was burnt three times and uh, thankfully the, the first fire provoked only affect the building uh, partially so this warned the director and the team to safeguard the collection so that was taken from the building uh, but the building itself and the installation is completely destroyed Beatriz, ¿y vas a agregar algo más? No, solo decir que la verdad es que la respuesta todavía no está clara. Violeta Parra es una persona muy querida y respetada en, en, dentro de la memoria eh, colectiva y, y justamente un, un museo que estaba poniendo eh, en valor toda su obra 
eh, fue deteriorado, es un indicador importante dentro de lo que es el tema de la violencia y la agresión. Um, the response is not clear yet. Uh, Violeta Parra is a very well respected figure and this museum is dedicated to her and now uh, it, has, is, it has been burnt like that. Muchísimas gracias. Um, I'm going to uh, pose another question that we've received and again this can be for any of our, our panelists. Um, first, it's written in Spanish, so I'll read in Spanish. ¿Cómo compaginar el turismo local y externo con la preservación del patrimonio material e inmaterial? ¿Están contrapuestas el acceso al patrimonio y la preservación? Very good question. Um, so the question in English is, how can we bring together tourism, both local and foreign, um, with the needs of preservation of both um, tangible and intangible heritage? Are they in opposition of each other? Access to heritage as well as uh, as well as preservation. Samuel, I see you nodding your head. Would you like to go ahead and respond to that? Uh, sí, con mucho gusto. Uh, bueno, yo pienso que, digamos, en el caso nuestro aquí en Antigua es un ejemplo perfecto de eh, esta situación con el turismo. O sea, tenemos muy claro eh, que en los próximos uh, seis meses únicamente eh, eh, veremos turismo local. O sea, Antigua es un destino turístico por excelencia, tanto locales como extranjeros. Ahora, los pronósticos, de acuerdo a los expertos, es que eh, son que eh, este, eh, estos meses que quedan del año eh, tendremos que reconfigurar, eh, reconfigurarnos los museos para atender a, a, la, a, a la población local o sea, un turismo local. Probablemente por diciembre eh, iremos viendo ya un turismo regional, tal vez del Salvador, de México, de países cercanos, pero el turismo internacional vendrá con suerte eh, el otro año, tal vez. Entonces, ahorita, eh, ¿cómo podemos integrar todo? O sea, yo pienso que eh, lo que estamos haciendo muchos en Antigua, nuestro museo, el museo que yo dirijo por... Por 33 años es la primera vez en la historia que se cierra 14 semanas y dependemos de un 95% de visitantes turísticos, de turismo. O sea que para nosotros esto fue un golpe mortal. ¿verdad? Como para todo, para todo eh, la, las instituciones culturales que hay en la antigua Guatemala. Entonces, el, la estrategia que debemos de tomar para integrar es... <coughs> atraer, cambiar nuestra museografía, o sea, nuestras historias, cómo vamos a cambiar toda la, la forma como contamos la historia, podemos usar los mismos recursos, los mismos objetos de la colección, o adaptar algunos con nuevas tecnologías, definitivamente, pero eh, de una manera que implique también temas más globales. Por ejemplo, el patrimonio inmaterial eh, tenemos que darlo a conocer a nivel global, Tal vez nos hemos concentrado en nuestro museo a, a proyectar un patrimonio inmaterial muy guatemalteco, muy maya, pero eso nos limita en visitantes. El, 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 desgraciadamente, el visitante local es muy uh, apático a, a, a lo propio. ¿verdad? Un guatemalteco te dice, mira, yo no voy a ir a un museo de textiles, aunque ya vieron que son bellísimos, porque los, estos textiles los veo en el mercado, los veo en la calle. Tenemos una cultura viva. Entonces, eh, obviamente un museo de textiles mayas o de instrumentos musicales mayas no le atrae a nuestra población porque vemos que es un, eh, lo damos por garantizado que lo tenemos en las calles. Por eso es que el turismo nos apoyaba. Sin embargo, ahora tenemos que cambiar eso en una forma que pues, eh, estamos limitados de viajar al mundo por las aerolíneas, por los costos, por lo que se viene. ¿Por qué no traemos el mundo a nuestros museos? Patrimonio inmaterial de otras culturas, que nuestra gente eh, aprenda de, del patrimonio inmaterial de otras culturas y a la vez subliminalmente se puede ir metiendo el patrimonio in, eh, material e inmaterial, ambos patrimonios, local, pero combinarlo de una forma más global para que sea atractivo y apetecible eh, e interesante para nuestro, nuestro, nuestras audiencias locales. So, What I'm saying is that uh, a, a perfect example here in Antigua uh, is that uh, we have all depended from tourism. Uh, 
Uh, our museum has been depending on tourism for 33 years. We have 1,500 visitors a month for 33 years, and now we have 14 weeks of nothing. So uh, it is the same of, for everyone in Antigua. Uh, so we are very concerned that uh, we have to forget about tourism, about international tourism for the next year, at least, or eight months. And the forecast of the tourism industry experts in the region is that uh, for the next six months, we will experience a lot of uh, local tourism. I mean, Guatemalans are, will come because, uh, you know, everybody is tired of being locked in. And, uh, and uh, maybe by the end of the year, we may experience some regional tourism from the neighboring countries, maybe. Uh, and then the international tourism that we had three months ago, you know, uh, maybe <laughs> will come back uh, at the, you know, maybe the second quarter of next year. And so that means that we cannot wait. We cannot sit with our arms closed waiting for international tourism. So the, 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 stra the strategy has been to change our museography, how uh, we will use our objects, the same collections, but we will tell the story in a different way. You know, we uh, usually, Guatemalans do not have, are not attracted to, 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 to see a textile museum. You know, you have seen beautiful textiles in the photographs, but we are used to see them in the streets, in the markets every day. So people think, uh, takes these things for granted. You know, they think they're going to be forever. So they say, why should I go to a museum? If I go, I just go to the market and I look at the textiles, I can listen to the marimba in every street every day. So why should I go to see it in a museum? Okay, that's understandable, but so, the strategy is to include the knowledge of tangible and intangible heritage in a global way. So we can attract our local visitors uh, by portraying intangible country, uh, uh, intangible heritage from other cultures, from South America, from uh, China, from Asia, you know, from all over the world uh, in a global way. So people will learn about, about the cultures of other countries, especially now that traveling will be so difficult. Let's bring the world to our museum. You know, people will have the opportunity to, to, to watch, uh, to learn about intangible cultural heritage in a general concept, and then we can land in Guatemala or wherever we like. The same with tangible cultural heritage. So basically the answer is to change the way we tell stories. You know, we, we, I'm sure we can use the same objects or maybe we have to do some small adjustments to tell a new story, but we have to reinvent. We have to be, you know, interesting for the communities, uh, for the for the visitor. Hey, thank you so much, Samuel. I think that your response actually also was uh, in line with somebody else's question at one point, which was regarding whether or not this whole move towards digitalization and virtualization is going to have an effect on um, interpretation. So I think that your, your conclusion is, is perfect. Um, I'm going to uh, present one more question and then I'm gonna hand the floor over to, unless Rodrigo wants to say something specific to what, yes, okay. Rodrigo, please. And then I'll ask the last question. Yeah, I, I'm going to go fast. I'm, I'll give you some maybe news of things that are happening at the EU level. We had a workshop uh, last Monday uh, with the three projects that we are financing now on cultural tourism. And um, this, uh, the coordinators of the project, well, they are doing it as all the other projects, they are finding this, so they have to reinvent not only the way of investigating, but also the field of their study. So they are investigating not only how to um, do research work in this crisis time, but how the cultural tourist destination can cope with this situation. And for example, they have just started to do that. For example, they are seeing how museums could provide personalized guides, virtual guides to groups. And they are investigating into that. And that could be, for instance, you could, you and your friends, could visit a museum from, you are in Brussels, you could visit a museum in Antigua, and you can get a personalized tour. They are trying to develop, I mean, these things that don't exist, but they are trying to develop that technology now. 
And so we will have another workshop in six months where they will share with us the results of what they are doing. So might be interesting maybe for you to be aware of that. So I am wondering, I mean, I will see maybe if Karin is interested or all of you are interested, maybe we could try, I mean, I understand that you are almost all, almost all of you related with e-commerce, right? So we might try to invite to that workshop some representative for, from e-commerce to get, um, to get uh, some hints on the last research on this field, that what, what we are doing these projects. Does anybody need a, a, a quick summary in Spanish of what I said? Eh, mejor, por favor, Rodrigo. Sí, vamos a ver. Digo que hemos tenido un taller el otro día con tres proyectos que tenemos de turismo cultural. Entonces, estos tres proyectos se encuentran con la circunstancia actual de la crisis en las que tienen están haciendo frente a dos tipos de problemas. Por un lado, cómo continuar la investigación y, por otro lado, eh, el objeto propio de la investigación, los lugares que son objeto de turismo cultural, cómo pueden hacer frente a la situación. Entonces, están investigando ahora de qué manera, con medios digitales, pueden hacer que estos lugares, como por ejemplo museos, puedan ofrecer productos particulares adaptados a situaciones de crisis. Por ejemplo, visitas virtuales de museos a grupos o a personas particulares que están en el otro lado del, del, del mundo. Entonces, son tecnologías y métodos que están desarrollando ahora en este momento y que probablemente en seis meses, cuando tengamos una nueva workshop, nos van a informar sobre resultados. Entonces, a lo mejor, eh, gente de ICOMOS Latinoamérica podrían manifestarme su interés y podríamos ver de qué manera les invitamos a la próxima workshop. Thank you so much, um, Rodrigo. And we're going to have our last question now, um, a, a loaded one, a packed one, um, for those of you who are still available. Um, so I will state it first in Spanish. Um, ¿Cuáles son los conceptos de la nueva museología que, que consideran hoy deben ser retomados tras la pandemia del COVID-19, sobre todo comprendiéndonos ante una nueva normalidad Y eh, continúa la pregunta, o una segunda pregunta, ahora que nos encontramos al interior del INCOM, replanteando el concepto del museo, ¿cómo nos tenemos que reconstruir y no solo redefinir? So, um, it's two questions, and I will, I will state them now in English. Um, what are the concepts of new muse the, the new, within new museology that you consider today are, need to be um, brought back to the table after... Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, especially understanding that we're uh, um, faced with a new normal. And also um, now considering that within ICOM, we are re, um, we're, we're within the debate of a new museum definition. Um, what do you think in regards to whether we need to reconstruct and not only redefine the museum? I see, I see nobody um, wishes to respond to that. So, oh, Karen, thank you. But I think Beatriz wants to say something. Uh, Beatriz, ¿vas a responder algo? Sí, voy a hacer un comentario. Gracias. Menor, un comentario menor frente a la nueva museología. Creo que la nueva museología es una disciplina eh, que eh, es, En, en estos momentos que estamos viviendo tiene mucha pertinencia, ya que considera eh, muy fuertemente la participación de la sociedad en, en el desarrollo museológico. Sin embargo, para también creo que para también a la nueva museología este, esta pandemia eh, le, le llevará a, a, a una serie de preguntas buscando respuestas de la mejor forma de desarrollar una museología concreta, una museología que realmente responda a las necesidades. Por otro lado, pienso que eh, este momento que estamos viviendo, y, y particularmente que está viviendo ICOM, con la redefinición del concepto museo, eh, 
nos lleva también a eh, tomar en consideración lo que estamos viviendo. O sea, la definición de museo tiene que ser re, re, reformulada dentro del contexto de una crisis también, y de una crisis tan relevante como la pandemia que estamos viviendo. Eh, no es un caso menor, no, es, no ha sido la única epidemia generalizada que hemos vivido, pero ha incidido fuertemente en la actividad museal. Pienso que eh, esta situación nos está diciendo mucho como para replantearnos la museología, como replantearnos los conceptos y para, para tomar de alguna forma eh, decisiones que consideren todos los escenarios, los escenarios críticos, los escenarios normales, en fin, creo que la tarea que tenemos por delante es muy grande, es muy significativa y creo que ICOM eh, tiene un, una ventaja muy significativa porque contiene y reúne a profesionales de todo el mundo. Por lo tanto, las voces que van a llegar van a ser de distintos países y de distintos eh, escenarios concretos. Pequeños, grandes, museos, museos comunitarios, ecomuseos, museos de base comunitaria, en fin, una infinidad de instituciones que tienen un mismo principio. Perdón, me olvido de la traducción, disculpa Ana. Okay. Está bien, voy a traducir hasta ahora y si quieres agregar algo. No, dale. Ok. Uh, well, she's speaking about new museology as a very relevant discipline right now, that especially because it considers society's part uh, within museums, but also presents the question of uh, what other new museology can be developed that responds to community needs. And um, Beatriz also speaks of the redefinition of the museum that also needs to take into account the current crisis, which is not um, the only pandemic, but it has had uh, such a strong impact on museum activities. So that museology concepts must respond to the situation and to crisis scenarios. The task is enormous, it is very important, and ECOM has the advantage of uh, gathering international professionals Uh, and perspectives from all kinds, uh, types and sizes of institutions. Thank you, Ana. Beatriz, ¿y vas a uh, aportar algo más? No. Dejo el espacio para otro si quiere participar, ¿no? Ok, muchísimas gracias. Uh, would anybody else like to address this issue? pressing issue. Um, all right, I think um, we've had a very, very fruitful uh, webinar series. I actually just want to uh, conclude with one final question for someone, uh, taking advantage that he's here and we've received one question specific to you. And it is whether or not, um, to what extent are the elders embracing the use of masks and social distancing to prevent the spread of virus? Well, it is a, a very surrealistic uh, situation that we see in the streets, in the communities. Uh, but I, ca I have, um, you know, I live uh, very close to indigenous communities. And uh, I'm really shocked that uh, they have taken this very, I mean, uh, they are aligning, let's say, following what everybody is following. They are assembling their own masks, you know, with, uh, weaving their own traditional with traditional fabrics, their masks. Uh, of course, uh, some are, uh, have uh, less uh, economical resources, so I can see all kinds of uh, uh, examples of masks in the indigenous communities, but uh, basically they are, um, they are following the rules and um, the social distancing also has been a challenge, but uh, authorities and uh, municipalities and local Uh, committees of uh, development of, uh, of the communities also have implemented uh, a lot of measures like signaling uh, on the floor in the markets. You know, markets are a very risky 
place, you know, because there's thousands of people and they are very close to each other. So there have been uh, uh, challenges to, to, to address this because, you know, people are used to go to the market uh, with the children, with the child, with the elders. And now, for example, in markets, you can only go alone. You, you are not supposed to, uh, you're not allowed to bring elder people to the markets or children. And uh, preferably if one only member of the family comes to, I'm talking about markets, uh, the same in supermarkets, but that, that's a different issue. But in the most remote areas, of course, there have been resistance of, of a few groups. You know, we, uh, like they, we are going on curfew from 6 p.m. to 5 o'clock a.m. It's been like more than a month of this curfew. And uh, some uh, communities do, do not want to respect this. You know, they think that's against their uh, their uh, life and also their uh, their rights to to circulate. Uh, right now, we have restrictions from move to from one province to another province. So uh, this affects a lot of the economy of uh, agricultural people. You know, if you want to sell avocados, if you want to sell tomatoes, onions into the neighbor uh, to to the next door community because that's the usual trend you know not all the crops are produced in in, in every community so we have to import uh, goods food from other communities and they are not being allowed to circulate and they are complaining that they are allowing the coca-cola trucks to circulate but why not our tomatoes and our, our onions you know like entonces lo que estoy eh, tratando de plantear es que eh, estoy sorprendido por un lado de la buena respuesta, la positiva respuesta que ha habido en las comunidades indígenas de eh, acatar las regulaciones de usar mascarilla, el distanciamiento social uh, y medidas se están tomando especialmente en los mercados. Ustedes saben, en las comunidades indígenas pues el, son comerciantes de nacimiento. ¿verdad? Desde niños ya están vendiendo... Entonces, esto es algo que afecta mucho porque eh, hay restricciones de movilización de una provincia a otra y esto pues perjudica a los agricultores que van a vender sus tomates a las 5 de la mañana, se le, los transportan a la ciudad capital o, a, o al mercado local de otra población y esto no se les está permitiendo. Se han perdido cosechas de, de brócoli, de tomate, de vegetales por por estas restricciones, lo cual ha sido muy rechazado por las comunidades indígenas, porque por otro lado se dejan eh, circular camiones de Coca-Cola, de cerveza, y entonces dicen, ¿por qué dejan circular cerveza y Coca-Cola y nuestros tomates, nuestros to nuestras cebollas, que son el alimento básico, no, no lo dejan circular? Entonces, eso es un... Es una buena pregunta para el gobierno porque no piensan en los sistemas de economía de las comunidades indígenas. Son muy diferentes a los de la ciudad. Entonces, eh, ha habido protestas, eh, paros, cierres de carreteras, bloqueos de carreteras de, en comunidades indígenas que, que, ha, han, eh, pues que no dejan circular estos camiones de, que dicen pues, que es de, de una élite ah, eh, o, de, o del, del sector empresarial digamos que, que sí está como de cómplice del gobierno, pero ¿por qué no los indígenas? Entonces, esto está creando a la vez también problemas sociales que se han tratado de, de mitigar, pero eh, en base a la respuesta, pues, de el distanciamiento social también ha sido muy bien adaptado en los mercados, no dejan entrar ancianos, no dejan llevar niños, normalmente las comunidades en los pueblos eh, llevan a toda la familia al mercado, entonces eso no es posible ahora, de preferencia una persona eh, responsable es la que dejan ingresar al mercado y en el piso se han marcado señales de cada metro cincuenta o un metro de distancia de dónde esperar para ser atendido y también el ingreso al, museo, al, al mercado es controlado. ¿verdad? Si antes entraban mil personas a, a la vez, pues ahora están entrando en cantidades más controladas. Thank you so very much, Samuel. Muchísimas gracias, Samuel. Um, we would like to remind um, our listeners of a few things. Uh, first, that um, we will be uploading the... Um, we will be up... So sorry, hold on one second. My, my son is coming in. 
Um, so sorry, so sorry. Um, we will be uploading this webinar in YouTube and it is immediately available currently on Facebook. Um, when we upload it to YouTube, it will have the subtitles in Spanish. Entonces, lo que estoy diciendo es que este webinario estará eh, disponible inmediatamente en Facebook y eh, posteriormente con los subtítulos en español. Entonces, para las personas que han hecho esos comentarios sobre eh, las dificultades en términos de eh, idioma, lo hemos tomado en cuenta para los futuros webinar webinarios. We've taken um, your suggestions into consideration for future webinars um, and we will be doing them fully bilingual. Um, and also, we just wanted to mention that you can um, get a certificate if you need a certificate of participation. Um, and in the chat, there is the email. Um, I'm going to hand over now to my co-moderator, Karen, um, to summarize and draw us to a close. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, you've been absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and um, it's been a lot of work for you and a lot of concentration. So thank you. On behalf of everybody watching, thank you, Lauren. That was fab. Yeah. You're very welcome, and, and I'm glad I was able to keep Milo at bay. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you. Well, first of all, thank you also to our speakers, um, all of you. Some have had to leave. Some of you are still here. And to re reiterate the role of the advisory board and the steering committee for our project, um, these personalities that we've met today, we've had the privilege to meet today, have been really instrumental from conception through to delivery of our project, keeping us right along the way. And next week you will hear from another one called Peter Davis, um, who will be moderating the next seminar too, and who's also an advisor to our project. Anna, could you translate? And then I'll do a wee summary. Is that okay? Would it be okay for Anna to translate? Hi. Um, hey. Karen eh, agradece a todos los eh, panelistas. Eh, han sido, son miembros del comité asesor del proyecto y han sido fundamentales para el desarrollo del proyecto desde su concepción eh, y, y desarrollo. Y eh, en la próxima vez también escucharán eh, Davis. Sí. Um, y vamos a compartir estos detalles a través de las redes sociales. Yeah. Um, so I agreed to make some summary remarks, <laughs> which is very difficult, but I've been making some notes <laughs> and <laughs> today, and um, I've pulled out a few key themes. Anna. Eh, sí. <laughs> Karen va a tratar de hacer un resumen. Esas son sus notas. Y bueno, va a notar los puntos clave. Ok. So, I think that um, Samuel summarized today's topic really well when he said that crises, not just corona, but crises in general for community-based museums present both challenges and opportunities. And where we've been, I think, has been in the middle ground, this kind of middle no man's land during lockdown, when we've had to stop, panic, stop, but now start to plan for the future. Um, Samuel eh, hace un, una síntesis del tema del seminario cuando habla de los museos comunitarios en crisis y esto ofrece tanto retos como oportunidades. Y estamos en un punto en medio eh, porque el confinamiento nos obliga a detenernos, pero también planear para el futuro. So just to pull out some key, key themes that I've noticed, I would say that adaptation has been one of the main themes coming through several of the papers. We've seen it for the role of new technologies, responding to the virus so that we can do things like this, but also um, the need to adapt with digital technologies for um, the digitization of cultural heritage as part of heritage preparedness, disaster preparedness, sorry. We've seen adaptation of a return to the local for gastronomy with Hugh de Verine's speech and for tourism also. 
And this was very much at the heart of what Luis Raposo was trying to say also um, with his Glam Plus, Plus model of a museum. The, re the need for a return to the local in this context, but maybe just in general thinking for the future. Eh, algunos temas claves son, primero, eh, la adaptación. Es un tema que se tocó en varias presentaciones. Eh, el uso de nuevas tecnologías como respuesta a la pandemia y que se ve en eventos como este. El uso también de tecnologías digitales para conservación del patrimonio. Y el punto que anotó Luis eh, sobre el regreso a las tradiciones locales. We've also seen the theme of community-based museums as a form of resistance. And this was something that came out really clearly in Teresa Morales' talk, um, when she spoke about the role of collective memory in community museums as a form of resistance, as it was in their beginning, but as it, as it is now in the context of increased um, discontent. Uh, también también el tema de los museos de base comunitaria como forma de resistencia eh, es algo que tocó la plática de Teresa Morales, eh, sobre todo respecto a la memoria colectiva y como forma de resistencia y forma de expresar el descontento social. Mm -hmm. um, another theme to emerge from Teresa was the importance of networking for staying strong in the face of crisis. And this also, I think, came out with Beatrice's um, presentation when she spoke of regional networking being important in the face of, of Corona as well, to keep the, the small community-based museums connected and therefore stronger. And también eh, Teresa habló sobre la importancia de las redes para mantenerse fuertes, así como Beatriz mencionó las redes regionales que crean conexiones con, entre los museos comunitarios y por eso se mantienen más fuertes. But to move on to um, Samuel's point about opportunities, that, that we must now think, turn and think about opportunities. Um, I really took his point that it's an opportunity to think more seriously about the role of intangible cultural heritage going forwards, how it's been affected and how for sustainable development, we need also to look at traditional knowledge, but in connection with new technologies and new science. And it's only through a combination of the two that um, we, can, we can learn from the past and prepare for the future and predict the future. Eh, para mencionar algunas de las oportunidades que presenta la crisis, eh, se refiere a pensar eh, más seriamente sobre el patrimonio intangible eh, para una en cuanto a sostenibilidad hay que tomar en cuenta tanto los conocimientos científicos como también los conocimientos tradicionales okay. well, just to, to conclude I thought the question about what kind of museology do we need going forwards was really important and just to say that I agreed with Beatrice's response and to go back to the sad moment from this morning, it was one of the last things that uh, Luis Repeto, uh, Repeto said at our reading week, um, our reading group two weeks ago. He said that at times like these, we need to go back to the round table of Santiago de Chile of 1972. He said it's as though we've learned nothing and that that is where we need to look now. Um, eh, y para concluir, eh, piensa que la pregunta sobre qué tipo de museología necesitamos ahora es muy importante y está de acuerdo con la respuesta de Beatriz. Y regresando al momento triste de recordar a Luis Repeto, hace unas semanas comentó en el grupo de lectura que hay que regresar a la Mesa Redonda de Santiago y que no habíamos aprendido nada. Entonces, retomar esas ideas. Okay, gracias, Anna. I think um, enough has been said, and we need to make some final thank yous to all of the people who have attended and stayed with us all of this time. You are diehards. You can see why community-based museums are now resilient, <laughs> because you have a lot of stamina. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Anna, thank you to Lauren, thank you to Jamie, 
and to all of our participants, all of our speakers. And I'll hand over to um, Jamie and Lauren to wrap up. Thank you, Karen. And now we will just briefly discuss the next webinars. And firstly, thank you all indeed for taking part today. May we take this opportunity to cordially invite you to join our second webinar on community experience and resilience. This will be held on Monday, the 29th of June at 3 p.m. Universal Time. Our speakers will include EULAC Museum Project Principal Investigators, who will showcase research across our regions. Our third webinar will focus on the theme of technology and offer examples from our technology and innovation research. This will be held on Friday the 10th of July at 3 p.m. Universal Time. Both events will be listed on our website and Facebook page to register for each event. On behalf of the EULAC Museums Project, and thank you all for taking part today. Eh, aprovechamos esta oportunidad para invitarlos cordialmente a unirse a nuestro segundo seminario en línea sobre experiencias y resiliencia comunitaria. Este se llevará a cabo el lunes 29 de junio a las 3 de la tarde, tiempo universal. Nuestros ponentes serán investigadores principales del proyecto EULAC Museums que mostrarán investigaciones a través de nuestras regiones. El tercer seminario en línea estará enfocado en el tema de tecnología y ofrecerá ejemplos de nuestra investigación sobre tecnología e innovación. Eh, se llevará a cabo el viernes 10 de julio a las 3 de la tarde, tiempo universal. Ambos eventos serán incluidos en nuestro sitio web y página de Facebook. Y en nombre del proyecto EULAC Museums, gracias por acompañarnos y esperamos verlos eh, pronto en los eventos futuros. Thank you all and take care.